And welcome, everybody. Welcome to uh, Skyto live stream for the 19th of February, my uh, youngest son's birthday. Uh, and tonight we're going to spend some time looking at a few things. And uh, as usual, I have Daryl with me. Hey there, Daryl. How are you? Well, Mark, I'm good. You? Hi, everybody. Just great. Okay. Um, uh, I like PG's comment. So good to hear that music. <laughs> See, it's like, oh, that means it's coming. It means that, the, that it's coming. I like that. Um, we're going to be looking at the horse head tonight uh, almost exclusively uh, because I want to actually do some deep viewing of the horse head. And to do that, uh, we need to, um, we need to uh, take longer exposures because I want to look at some of the dark nebula that's hiding back there that we haven't seen yet. Uh, but as a preliminary object, I was just checking the system by um, looking at a, a little planetary nebula called the Robin's Egg Nebula. And uh, let me just bring up the planetarium system so you can see kind of where it is. All right. It is right here in the constellation of Eridanus. Uh, no, that's not Eridanus. What is that? Um, is that Eridanus there? It looks like a snake. What yeah, is that? that's Aridonis. Okay, so that's the river. Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah. And thank you for the well wishes to Hunter, whose middle name, by the way, is Orion. <laughs> O-R-I-O-N. My oldest son's middle name is Galileo. Eh, go figure. Astronomer's sons, right? Um, so, yes, yeah, so there is where we're looking. And it's actually down toward the southwest. But I thought we would check it out because it's really pretty. Uh, and use that as a first object for tonight, uh, a test object. And as you can see, uh, when I, let me balance the color here. Zoop, okay, there we go. And you can actually see some really nice detail. I've actually stacked <laughs> uh, 101 frames. So I was doing this uh, long before I started the stream. I've uh, you know, I actually been working in this just to check it out, get a good look at it. So let's uh, check out this particular object a little more closely yeah and I can see that we have a focus issue so all of the things I did for the last few minutes are useless not a problem because it wasn't meant to be a serious object anyway so I'm going to clear that and I'm going to go back to the first one second shot and I will refocus I uh, forgot to do the level set for the focus, so that's my fault. All right, so we'll do this, and now uh, get rid of the stack, because we don't need to stack. And then we'll go back. As I said, we're going to go to the horse head shortly, in a moment, actually. All right, and now let's bring up our focus system. And let's go and set that focus all right and that's what we're gonna do right now so all right so over here uh, I don't did I even set it no I didn't even turn it on the wonder I had a problem duh okay well we'll just uh, I'm gonna set this in place so I'm gonna start uh, getting our focus set let's go to this first to see if that's that preset works better for us and if it does, that's cool. Yeah, so we're going to be going a little south of that as well. And once it's focused, then we can start moving through the sky and getting to the horse head. But now that I'm on the robin's egg, I do want to take a picture of the robin's egg. Er, that's actually uh, a white dwarf we're focusing on right there. The robin's egg is right here. All right, So that's actually a white dwarf in the middle of that. That's why it's sort of a bluish color. Extremely hot star. All right, let's drop this a little more. All right, that right, looks pretty good. And now let's go turn on our focus. The temperature right now is 61 degrees in the building. All right, and we've now enabled our temperature based focus and there we go all right so now 
while we're here, I'll just do this again. It's not going to take long. It was only a 12 second shot. I'll make it 15 seconds just for fun. 15 seconds. Get rid of that. Get into the stack. And. Oh, this has to go. This is uh, the previous frame. All right. Okay. I'll do this. So this is the first frame. So look how noisy the first frame is. See, this is what you get when you just take one single frame at a time. You know? Um, so all that modeling is noise that has to get removed. And you're going to see it happen with this next frame. You're going to watch it get dimmer. Watch. Okay. So then it gets a little dimmer. Okay. And then we're going to stack a fourth frame. And it's going to get dimmer still. And over time, we're going to lose a ton of that noise. Because it's getting averaged out. All right. And then you'll reach a point where it's suddenly you can see the object very clearly. You know, it's like magic. We're watching it appear right before our eyes. Nobody else does this. I don't know why. You know. So I want to say hi. Hey, Donald. Tim F. is here. Daisy and Zoe. Hi, guys. Uh, this is the... And Jessica S. is here. Hi, Jessica. And Petita. PG. How are you? Good to see you're here. Genghis is here. Um, and who's who's Daryl? Who's that Daryl guy? Some Pay, no <laughs> Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. And we have Vera Lucia Campos. How are you? Uh, thank you again for the well wishes for Hunter Orion. That's very kind. How many is he? Well, he's 24. Oh, I don't even remember being 24 anymore. Mm, well, that's okay. Because... I didn't remember that I had an age. <laughs> That's all right. All right, let's just do the color correction here. Let's see. Uh, when I was 24, I was still living in Breckenridge, Colorado, up in ski country. Mm -hmm. I was skiing my buns off, and uh, mm. I was skinny and tanned and handsome, and uh, that's about it. <laughs> 24 would have been I would have been working at the mine then wow kind of grew up you working guess. at the mine mm -hmm. I understand So this is a uh, planetary nebula. It's a uh, remnant of a dead star. And the dead star in the middle is the white dwarf that you see there. That's why it's a little blue because it's so hot. And that is the reason that it's glowing green, okay? Because the star ejects its outer envelope over time when it's dying. It swells to a red giant. Then it contracts and it swells again. And it just keeps doing that back and forth. And that back and forth process will eventually cause the outer layers to basically slough off and become free of the star because they're already so far away from the star when it's a red giant. That said, uh, the star then, um, you know, starts to shrink down again. And finally, when there's nothing left to fuse, it shrinks down to a white dwarf. And it doesn't get any smaller. It contracts down to a white dwarf uh, because a white dwarf is being held up by something called electron degeneracy. It just means that, you know, imagine a chessboard, and you can put elementary particles like electrons in each of the squares on a chessboard. When you fill up the chessboard, you can't put any more electrons in there. Okay? And so that means that they're packed as tight as they can get. All right? Ooh, satellite, zing. And when they're packed as tight as they can get, then they actually exert a pressure... Uh, outward, and that's called electron degeneracy pressure, and that's what holds up the white dwarf uh, from collapsing further. Add more mass to it, and it could collapse further and go past electron degeneracy right into 
neutron degeneracy and becomes a neutron star. But generally, the process that causes it to do that also causes the white dwarf to explode in a type 1a supernova. So, but this here is a single star that died and collapsed, and it, uh, as it, after it ejected all of its outer layers, um, leaving only that white dwarf, then uh, its ultraviolet radiation, that hot, high energy, high frequency radiation it hit those oxygen molecules or oxygen atoms actually out in that outer envelope and it causes them to glow like this and they glow green uh, it's really a pretty pretty sight and that's the case with many planetary nebulae as we've often said here daryl said it to you before as well quite oblong for a planetary yeah and when i take down the dark side a little bit you can see that there's an area here where there's not a whole lot of um, material, right? It's kind of cool. weird. So it actually expanded in an odd way. Now, what could cause that? There's a number of things. Uh, one thing that could have happened is that the planetary, as it began to uh, have its gas move outward, okay, it ended up encountering more material in the interstellar medium slowing it down on one side perhaps because uh, there's not nothing out there there's there's stuff there's tons of stuff as we saw with the dust you know uh, so that said this is our take up object the object that we uh, that we uh, mess with while we're waiting for the sky to get pure dark uh, and that way we'll be able to go to the horse head and spend the time we want to spend there I want to say hello to Anna Hata 77 News. Bonnie. Hi, Bonnie. How are you? Uh, nice to see you. Uh, and I believe it's interesting because I actually did not post anything on Facebook saying we're doing this. And I see people here that are getting the alerts somehow, like Greg B. Hi, Greg. How are you? Welcome to SkyTrail Livestream. If you haven't subscribed to us, uh, please go ahead and do that. All right. Because um, it's all free. And all these objects that we take pictures of are made available to you free of charge uh, on our live server where you can go check things out from months and months ago. Uh, and I, I was actually writing a post the other day, Daryl, and I said, you know, in the post, you know, we've got at least 135 streams up there now on, on the, on the uh, Sky Tour channel. Yeah. I went to look. <laughs> There's over 500. <laughs> it's wow. like. Wow, yeah, wow, I, I didn't, hmm, time flies. How long have we been doing this, like three years? Uh, I first came on board uh, Sky Tour uh, 2017. Wow, that's four years. And before that, it was Amanda and I. And Amanda, you know, got busy with KGRA, and she hasn't been able to join us. Wow. Well, I wasn't a member of Sky Tour for quite a while. I, uh, I know I started hanging out here, and uh, you made yeah, you me a mod, and uh, yep. I think Amanda eventually helped propel me into Sky Tour livestream. Yeah, which is good. That's good. We miss Amanda. I'd like to get her to come back. Yeah. Well, speaking of, you know, I bet a Messier Marathon would bring her in. And uh, <laughs> I met her a little night. last night, and I did a little more looking after the stream last night. And uh, yeah, they're saying, I think it's March the 5th and April the 2nd are primary dates. Uh, they're both dark of the moon, and they're both on Saturdays. Uh, okay. So if, we, if we get to do one, maybe we could convince her to come come uh, hang out with us again. Oh, that'd be pretty cool. I can start her doing it. Get her back. Back in the fold. All right. So I believe that evening twilight. Let's see. It's uh, almost 8 o'clock out there. And... Yeah, we we should be, we should be over. Look at that beautiful 
uh, look at that beautiful uh, line of material in this outflow from this area. I mean, I'm not sure if that's from the from the expanding shell around the star or if that's an interloper gas uh, you know gas tendril or dust tendril. You know, but look at this really interesting shape, huh? All right. Well, this is good. Well, we're going to pause it here with 38 stacked, and we're going to save this. You see the green bar across the top? That's our FITS file. That's the uh, that's the file that is the astronomical file format that we use. But you can get a free viewer to look at that, but you don't need one because I'm also saving the PNG file that you see right there. That's the regular graphics file. It's this image exactly. <clears throat> so you actually get to see this just a uh, in just a few minutes. Um, and my name up there, this, I put the name of the object we're looking at right up here, and then that gets appended into the file on the server. So, now that we've done that, we can clear this. Because tonight, I've actually set up the telescope trying to optimize it to uh, you know, guide uh, around the celestial equator, which is uh, where Orion is, basically. And I want to try and get the... Um, I might try and get the Horsehead Nebula, but I'm going to do a different, doing a different look of the Horsehead Nebula. I'm actually going to do this in a very different way. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to. Let's see, make sure this is all right here. All right, let me get out of this. Hold on one second. I'm doing twenty things at once in my head, and I, I I'm failing miserably on all of them. Um, so. Uh, exactly, <laughs> exactly. What? <laughs> All right. So let me drop this down. That's better. That's what I was looking for. Okay. This is the mode I call my hyper mode. It's like a, a, a image intensified finder, basically. Uh, the camera we're pushing the camera camera to its limits a little bit. And allowing us to see what's in the night sky. So this is like a, every second. This is an image uh, taken every second. All right. We get to see some cool things every second. So let's now. Uh, and hello to uh, Cindy and Zatarak. How are you guys? Now we're going to go up to Orion again. And it's right there. Higher in the sky. And we're going to go to. The Horsehead Nebula. Now, the Horsehead Nebula was, uh, I guess, forevermore defined by E.E. E. Barnard, and he put it in his catalog as number 33. It's Barnard 33. Yes, there's a catalog of dark stuff out there, and you look at the sky and say, but it's all dark. Not really. Okay, the clouds of dust that are out there are not actually black. They're actually kind of brownish, sooty color, which is kind of neat, you know. So uh, we'll use uh, this reflection nebula next to the horse head as a guide, and we'll just go there. I've also noticed that there's some database errors, not mine, but in the in the in what we're hunting for. Sometimes uh, there's database errors, and they, it goes to the right star, but then goes to the wrong place, and I have to correct it on the fly. Uh, not my fault. You know, it's just the way this database works that we have. Uh, but uh, we'll see how it works tonight. Okay, so it's bringing that star in. I'm not sure which star it is. It's either Bellatrix or Scythe. Uh, let me just zoom out to see if we can get to it before. It's safe. Right down here. Okay, and then it's going to go there. And it should be able to handle that one. And it does. Okay, good. Now I'm going to do something a little strange, Daryl. I'm actually going to... Uh, I'm going to move us down and just center these parts right here and what's lower over here because we're going to be looking deeply into this area over here. Okay. Oh, thank you for putting up the uh, link there. Yeah, well, Isabella's not here. So... Not at yet. least get people a head start. Yeah, it's in the description, not... too. Okay. Go ahead. 
Oh, I probably will not be posting uh, links to individual images like she does. But no, uh, no, maybe that's she'll okay. show up later. Yeah, she'll be here. All right. So what I'm gonna do now is uh, go back just a tad, and instead of three degrees, I'm gonna go up like this. Yeah, see the horse head coming in now. I'm going to center that object of interest. And I don't care about the flame nebula. In fact, when I make the final imagery, I'm going to crop it out. I'm just going to be doing these right here. All, all this stuff in here. All right, so we're not even going to see... Um, we're not even going to see the flame too well, which is fine. And I'll just make sure that we're all good. We may see a piece of the flame, but again, we got to ignore that. <clears throat> what did Donald do that I missed? By where the scope's facing, what's he saying? Uh, I remarked that uh, you talked, somebody said that we could hardly even see Orion risen yet earlier in the winter. And uh, oh. I said by 11, it's well over in the west or the southwest now. Yeah. Okay. All right, this is going to be our our almost quite, not quite uh, operational location tonight. I'm going to move us over a little bit to the east a little bit more. I'm going to put that off center. And the reason is because I want to focus on what's down here as well as what's up there. So um, I may want to just drop us down just a bit. Okay. All right, so what we're going to do tonight is we're going to bore the, the, the bejesus out of you. I'm going to try and do... Uh, I'm going to start with one-minute exposures, but I want to see if I can get up to about three or four minutes per exposure and see what we can get. Um, if that's too much for you, you know, then I understand if you want to leave and go watch something on TV. Um, but on the other hand, it's a peaceful night with wonderful music and good people. So you could hang out here and enjoy. Let me just make sure that we're focused again. I'm always leery of the focus system. I'm actually working on getting an, a true autofocus system too. But I don't want it to start changing focus. This is good. I don't want to start changing focus in the middle of a uh, exposure, you know. So we got to be careful about some of that. Because what it does is it actually it kind of vibrates the telescope a little bit. It's a little tiny motor on the telescope that slowly turns. All right, so this is our subject of interest right there that we're familiar with, the horse head and then these two uh, reflection nebulae. Of course, the flame and the wall here. But down here, this is all the stuff I want to focus on. So we have a guide star now. And I'm going to start with, uh, let's start with 60-second uh, exposures. And let's see how they turn out. If they look good, we will go um, up to more. This is sort of, um, you know, if you're doing deep sky work like this, you know, you're going to end up, doing 10 and 20 minute exposures okay um i'm not doing that now but that is what you could end up doing all right so this will be our first stacked image it'll be a 60 second exposure um and i'll see how the guiding is and if it's uh if it's good we'll let it continue if it's not we'll stop make some adjustments and do it again I just love watching the images unfold before our eyes. You know, they're really cool. Sure. All right, so we should see this in a minute. I got to meet the neighbors today. I told you about them. Oh, yes, the new neighbors. Yeah, and they were very nice, and I asked... That's good. 
very politely uh, if they would mind aiming their lights down and uh, they were happy to do so and that's they pointed nice. them down they also had an intensity control and uh, that's good so uh, I looked at them tonight and uh, much better much better that's They're not great. blinding me anymore when I go out front awesome that's very nice Okay, look at already. Yeah, already we've got additional detail in here. And that 60 second shot really worked great. Look at that, Daryl. Uh huh. We can see some billowing clouds and so forth. This is one frame. We're going to put another one in now. And uh, there doesn't seem to be any wind out there, so we should be okay. Oh, yeah. Now, see, right away, a lot of the noise went away. That's look. That looks nice. Cool beans. Yeah, and we're gonna just do a little bit. Just drop this into the, pull the black level up. I mean, there we go. Look at that. That's beautiful. Now you can see the detail here. This is this is gonna make a nice photograph. Hmm. Folks, if you have any questions or you want to ask questions about anything, um, we're here. You know, Daryl's my favorite, uh, you know, astronomer. I'm I'm an astronomer, um, and we are uh, here for you to answer any questions you like. If you have no questions, enjoy. Your favorite? No, Goodness. actually, Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan was my favorite. Give me a big head like that. Oh, well, you've I'm just, you've actually I'm just a you've guy. done some really good things. You've done some really nice things for us, and, and so I don't forget that. Well, look at that! Wow. I don't you want know, to Darryl, be a nice guy. I'm just a good. You guy. don't? I try. <laughs> All right. You know, Daryl. As I look at this, and one of the things I think about is. Um, there is so much going on in the Orion molecular cloud that it just behooves us to be able to see it. And you notice that the, the horse head is a, a actually a more dense location than the areas back here. Really kind of interesting, you know. There's some other dark knots coming out down below it. Toward down the here? Center, like, yeah, there and the one below that. And yeah. Yeah. Oh, what a satellite. A satellite. Well, you know what? That's okay. That's going to go away. That's going to go away as it averages itself out. Boy, that's something. TK I can't impress a... says, so what are we looking at here? What do we think happened? Oh, well, uh, this is... Uh, we're deep in Orion. Uh, if you want to know exactly where we're looking, let me just go bring up our planetarium and I'll show you. Here's Orion. There's Betelgeuse. There's Bellatrix. There's Saif and Rigel. And here's the Orion Nebula, which we're not looking at. We're here. Okay, we are looking right here at the leftmost star in Orion's belt. If we zoom in, you see that there is the Horsehead Nebula right here, and we're looking in this region right here. Actually, we're actually centered uh, right about here. All right, uh, if I was to center on the telescope, uh, it won't be exact, but it's pretty close. All right, so when you come back here, you'll see that the Horsehead is here. Look at all that detail, wow, that's incredible. TK, this is just a small part of what's called the Orion Molecular Cloud Complex. It is a huge cloud of uh, dust and gas towards the constellation Orion. And when we take really deep exposures, we can see much more than you think there might be at first glance. It's just and a tremendous looks, cloud. It looks like this exposure is getting uh, traipsed on by multiple satellites. We've got that one there and now we got this one here. Uh, Thanks, Elon. 
I don't know if that's a Starlink, but I can tell you one thing. Um, this was how bright it was in the first exposure, but that shows that it's actually dimmer. So that might yeah. just be a regular satellite that's that's going into the Terminator, so we might not see it for the rest of the trip here. I can get rid of these, actually, in post. All right, and let me... Uh, let's see if we can... Uh, let me actually try to do this right here. Let's try to see where it wants to go. Okay, that's beautiful. All right, that's really pretty. Look at how detailed this is right there. That's really nice. Yeah. Wow. When we've looked at this in the past, folks, uh, you see from Alnatak, the really bright star at the upper right, uh, there's kind of a bright line in the uh, cloud running down past behind the horse head and continuing on down toward the bottom and we thought in the past that was sort of like seeing a cloud wall from the side that we're seeing it almost in profile and it'd be interesting to see with a really deep exposure how much more comes out now exactly i'm gonna pull back the black level just a little because I really want to see a little more of the detail in this cloud. Let's try that. Wow. So we've done seven, seven exposures so far. Remember that diagonal satellite? You can almost not see it now. I told you it was going to go away. It's getting averaged out, and this one is gone already, so we're not going to see that one. So unless it's a really bright satellite, it's going to get averaged out over time. So you don't fret when you see the satellite. It doesn't ruin the shot, because it's going to go away. Uh, on a hot earlier, Bonnie said that on the way home from work, she saw a shooting star. That's cool, and you know what's funny about the shooting stars, okay, these meteorites, these, these meteors, these little tiny pieces of... Uh, debris that come into our atmosphere and burn up they actually believe it or not most meteors that you see in the sky are only the size of a single grain of sand and I know that sounds hard to believe what's even more hard to believe is that they're about 90 to 100 miles up in the sky and you can see them so brightly um, that kind of gives you an idea of how well they're bonded together it takes a lot of energy to start separating them the 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 uh, atoms and and ablating them, burning them, uh, but that's what happens. And sometimes it's just spectacular. And if it's a much larger piece, if it's the size of my fist, well, you might actually see uh, uh, you might actually see a trail of smoke left behind, and you might actually see it breaking up into multiple pieces. Ray Bobel, hey, I was just thinking of you today. I was going to send you another email saying, are you okay, man? Ray's with us tonight. Good to see you, brother. And we're doing the Orion Nebula. And Donald asked a question. How many frames does it take to eliminate the satellite traces? Well, uh, we're doing 60-second shots right here. And if you notice, the satellite trail is almost gone. And it came in uh, approximately three frames ago. So uh, that extra time, if we take a longer frame, the satellite trail will go faster than with a shorter frame. Uh, but... Uh, we are definitely uh, getting rid of it. And uh, this one down below here should also uh, start to dim out a little bit. And it is, see? That one there is starting to go too. I predict that'll be gone too. Look at all this detail. Holy cow. Let me actually uh, let me do two things. Let me see where it wants to put the... Uh, there we go. It's going to do that. I want to actually bring back a little bit of our dark because the devil's in the details all right and i think the color is still good there we go uh. Uh. Yeah, I, I removed that person from the uh, stream until such time as they demonstrate they can come back. 
All right. Let's just bring this back a little bit. Get a little more contrast in that in the darks. <clears throat> One thing to notice in here, when you look here, you actually you notice that there's modeling. There's a lot more going on in here than you realize. Um, and I can do something else right here. Let's try and bring the lights together a little bit. Let's do what's called a stretch. And that's going to pull out some more of the data. Wow. Okay. And now, in order to add the, like the cream of the crop, what we're going to do is we're going to add a uh, instant sharpening. Watch carefully now. Okay, you notice how that changed? Okay. Right. We're sharpening everything up. So now it's going to be even brighter and more delineated. These are just one minute shots. You know, so we're going to take a, you know, we got, we're at 12, 12 minutes of, of frames that we've done so far in this. This would be the equivalent of a 12 minute exposure. All right. Uh, essentially. Uh, not not in reality but uh, notice the diagonal satellite trails all but gone now and we're gonna go one more frame and then we're gonna actually see if we can do a two-minute set of frames and see what happens the Aaron slightest Stein wind will <laughs> oh, hey Marty we gotta go back to the future Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're into the past. <laughs> All right. All right, so this here. Go back to our histogram. Let's play a little more with that. Drop that in. Get that a little darker, a tiny bit. Without ruining our data. And then let that settle out and see what it looks like. Oh, uh, now you can you can start to see almost three dimensionality in here, can't you? Yeah. The other thing I want you to notice is at this wall here that we call it. You see these fine filamentary structures coming off. This is a very fine detail that's often missed in the photos of the horse head when people take pictures because it's really very subtle. But we been we capture it very nicely. Uh, another thing we capture, which tells us it's a good night. Uh, yeah, hey David Schmidt, yeah, you're getting spoiled, all right. And you what? You deserve it. Uh, here's another one. Let's go into 100% now, and it looks pretty good. Let's just go over to the horse head. Okay, another thing that tells you it's a good night is whether you can see that star right there. See that star in the mane of the horse head right there? If you can see that star, it means that you've got a really good night and a good setup and good focus. And uh, we've got all, all that. You can also see a star in the snout. That one's another uh, little telltale sign. Marcin, hi there, Marcin Johansson. And uh, one Nick, he actually was asking a question earlier about Betelgeuse. He wanted to know about Betelgeuse, and uh, I want to mention to you that Betelgeuse, being 750 light years away, could already have gone supernova. Because um, we do expect that it will soon, uh, soon, cosmically speaking. And so that means that it could have gone already, but that the light information is a long train of light coming to us, and we're seeing the light that left 750 years ago when we look at it now all right and um so doing that you know we have to consider that even though we're looking back in time it's going to take if, if it went supernova say six months ago all right we're going to still see betelgeuse shining in the sky for 749 years and six months all right and then once it actually um that light reaches us of the, with the explosion, then we'll see it. It's all a time machine. Every one of these stars you see here, a time machine. Every one of them. All it talks about 1,500 light years away? Uh, something like that. 
So we're seeing Alnitok as it was 1,500 years ago, but it's only about 4 million years old, a little little more, a little less. You know, so um, it's kind of interesting. And Marston is right. We wouldn't know, you know, regardless until the light reaches us. It's exactly what we're saying. It's right. Yep. yep. Wow, this is something. Now, after I do this shot, we're going to, you know, do the two-minute shots and see how those come out. And if those work, we'll do an equal number. Um, and then uh, I want to start with one minute because I know one minute works. Okay, so I'll let this one come in, and this will be the last frame. We're going to do 17 frames. Uh, one minute. So that's 17 minutes you guys have been sitting here. You guys are patient. <laughs> but I told you. I told you we are going to be doing this. Okay. So now we'll pause this. And this is really a beautiful... This is a beautiful shot. This is really stunning. And now we'll save it. And now this fits uh, file is the stack. Um, and then we're going to save the image as you see it here exactly as it is. And there it is. The ping file is now going to be sent up to our server. And Daryl put the link in earlier. It's in the description. You need, you need to rename your file. Oh, I did, didn't I? Boy, some people Jeez. Ah, I know, huh? Darn it all. Thank you for that. Yeah. Gotta stay on top of you every second anymore. I know. I know. All right. Uh, so, yes. So, what I'm going to do now is uh, I am going to save this again. And now it will be saved up there in the right directory. It might... See, that, that message that came up, it might be renaming what I just saved, knowing I might have made a mistake. That's what I hope. So, if there's that's two horse head directories up there, that's good. Yeah, it looked like it. I was doing that last night, too. Okay. Okay, no, so our ping is saved. Uh, go ahead. No, go ahead. All right, so this is... We're set here. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to clear this, and we're going to start doing two-minute shots. We're just crazy, aren't we? But if you look where the telescope's pointing, okay, see it up there? It's pointing really high in the sky. So this is gonna this is either way, this is the best time to try this. Alright, we're gonna do 120 seconds now. Ay ay ay. Off we go. And we're gonna get rid of that message because it'll go anyway. Uh <clears throat> and then our live stack. For Marson's comment uh, about the part yeah. that we look back and referring to what you said a couple of minutes ago about uh, stars being time machines, you know, the whole idea of look back time and all that. Yeah. Uh, we should talk about simultaneity sometime. Concept I'm not sure I have my head wrapped around completely, but. Uh, okay. You know, it's like if somebody millions of light years away could magically, with a big enough telescope, look at Earth, you know, if, if they could have literally seen dinosaurs walking around on the planet, that whole train of thought, but, uh, you know. Well, I mean, realistically, yes. Uh, I thought of another thing, too. If you could find something out in space that was a mirror that would basically reflect what was happening on the earth and you could make sense of it uh then you would actually be able to see depending on how far away it is you'd be able, you'd be able to see it back in time on earth and look back on our own history yeah you know which is kind of interesting you know <clears throat> well again i don't know how to express it correctly um it has to do with like uh different gravity wells you know like if we're in the sun's gravity well 
and we look at another star out in space and it's in its own gravity well uh, mm -hmm. that you know what what's the, the meaning of things happening in two different gravity wells at the same time is it is does that really even have any true meaning again yeah. i don't really have my head wrapped around that well but uh okay you know like what is now There's... what what was then hmm. and i, I guess okay well i mean in 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 terms of physics and relativity okay simultaneity uh, means that two events are simultaneous um, in a given system of reference. So, um, and that's if they occur at the same time as measured by some time frame you've set up. Yeah. You know, like uh, you know, so forth. So, um, and they would actually be synchronized by light signals. Okay, what just happened? That's better. See, it does this. <laughs> I don't get it. It's weird. It does some weird stuff to me. Incidentally, this is coming to an end, this, this weird stuff that happens sometimes with our telescope, because Starlink has been shipped to our location, and we're going to get it Sunday. And we're going to install it, and we're no longer going to be facing problems uh, with our system. Who's installing it for you? Uh, we got a couple people out there that are going to do the install. Um, I can't get out there this month. I, I think I've got a, I may have a project for an aerospace company to do. And if so, I won't be able to do it. Okay, we have a little bit of a, uh, error in our tracking. But I'm noticing that we're seeing some more detail in here that I haven't seen. But, uh, if we close if we close in really close here, you'll notice that uh, we have an error in our declination, which is our north south tracking. Um, and you can see it right there. Yeah, so I'm thinking I'm gonna change. I'm gonna change. Uh, I'm going to change some of the parameters. Okay. Uh, doing this now. Let's see here. Um, and let's go and get this parameter set change here. Pardon me while I... Pardon me while I fix this. All right. So here, we're going to do this. And this rate, we're going to go from 05 to 03. And the next rate is going to go from zero one to zero three. <clears throat> so make them the same and see if that makes a difference. And then we go through the painful uh, reliving of this by clearing this out, which I know you don't want me to do. But oh, we have to. Calibrations are always a pain in the butt. <clears throat> so that's what we're doing. <clears throat> okay, let's see now. We have 18 seconds, 15, 14, counting down. Marston says, relativity gives me a headache. <laughs> that's funny. Hey there, Dagger. How are you? All right, let's see if this one worked. <laughs> okay, now we have a little east-west error. Um, which is not too exciting. But it actually looks like there was some shaking there. It looks like there was a shake involved, too. I don't mean a milkshake. I mean, look at the weirdness. That's kind of weird. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. 
All right, let's uh, go back to the auto view here for a minute. I mean, it looks deceptively like it's 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 good, but um, it's not. Um, there's a problem with that. So if we zoom in again, we just make sure we're centered. Yeah, the other thing too is uh, there's a fine balance exercise to go through with the telescope, and um, I haven't I haven't done that much of it because um, I didn't uh, I never thought I would be taking very long exposures because I've got people watching from all over the world. I didn't want to make them wait. Uh, then Starlink gets installed. You notice when I, I don't, you, you can't see when I click, but I click and then a couple seconds pass before the click actually takes hold. So everything I do is by clicking ahead of time and then waiting for the response. So I'm like doing this one ahead thing all the time. And it's really very, very tedious. With Starlink, I won't have to do that. It'll be real time. Well, it looks like the two-minute exposure didn't pull out that much more here. Yeah. The one-minute exposure did a fine job. So why don't we go to one minute then and just stay at one minute? So we'll clear this and go back to one second so I can set up our new placement. Uh, one second. One second. <laughs> All right, and so let's get our nice uh, view here. And then I'm going to drop the telescope down some more. All right. Come down lower to the bottom of this area here. That's good. I need to have enough in here because... When I put them together in a mosaic, we want to be able to see it all. Okay. So there is Sigma Orionis right there. There's the horse head at the top. All right. So that gives us enough overlap. So now the telescope is getting its guide star. Focus is still good. Uh, so what we can do now <coughs> is set our time again to 60 seconds and go for it so now we're going again 60 seconds we'll get our live stack up clear the previous if it hasn't been but it has and that's good Ronald's here Ronald's here oh look at that Ronald A.K.A. Robin Williams. How you doing? If you guys have not had the pleasure of meeting Ronald, you'll swear you're meeting Robin Williams because he looks like him. Which is, of course, a compliment. How's it going, Ronald? I was surprised first time I saw a picture or a video of Ronald hearing him talk, I, for some reason, I always imagined him as looking like Yosemite Sam from, uh, <laughs> you know, Looney Tunes. And he didn't look like anything like what I imagined. Wow. See that, Ronald? You are, you're deceiving people. You're deceptive. Wow. That's pretty cool. All right, let me uh, do a color correction. All right, now let's look at the rest of this. So you notice now the wall goes down way down into this region. There's so much more to this. So uh, I'll make a mosaic of that upper region and then this lower region. It looks like the 60 seconds seems to work the best
we'll get to do more uh, once I uh, do some more calibrations in the telescope. I do have to do periodic error correction as well. Do you do it periodically? <laughs> I do not. I train it and forget it, you know. What that means, folks, uh, and uh, Daryl was only half kidding, I think, when he said that, because um, you, I've heard tell that you can, Daryl, periodic error correct, and it it builds on the last one as well and helps refine it. Uh, uh -huh. But I don't, uh, I don't do that. Now, what that is is you know, the reason this telescope is following the stars is because there's a drive that's actually going in very slowly toward the west, which to me is to the right in my view here. And but it's a it's a little worm gear, and you know worm gears are manufactured to very very high specifications, very good tolerance. However. Um, there are errors in the drive and because it's a singular worm gear every few minutes that same error comes up so the end result is it, it kind of does this thing it, it actually moves around uh, if you leave it in the scope you'll see the star drift around if you just leave it unattended All right, you'll actually see the star drift around just a little bit every like 6 minutes in this particular case that's a 6 minute uh, turnaround for this particular telescope so at six minutes, you know, you can actually correct that you can you know that periodic error that it gets over a period of six minutes. And the telescope, once it sees its periodic error, can fix it. Right? And so it, it puts in a correction and allows it to be corrected. Uh and that's good for quite a while. Um so uh, I haven't ever periodic error corrected the telescope since it was fixed. It was periodic error corrected earlier. Um, and if I did that periodic error correction, that might fix the two minute and three minute uh, exposures. Yeah. So we'll see. Hey, weird guy. Weird guy's here. DK, I don't know if I said hi to you, but hello. Well, speaking as a mechanic, uh, uh, no drive system is perfect, uh, and as Mark said, I mean, there's these worm gear sets are hopefully uh, manufactured to great precision, but uh, they're all a matter of uh, machining, like on a mill or a lathe, and there are always imperfections in the surfaces, the mating surfaces between the worm and the gear, and uh, you get down to the point where very slight imperfections in those ideal surfaces can cause the uh, the drive from moment to moment to run a hair fast or hair slow you know sort of a little jiggle in there and uh, the whole purpose of the drive correction is to uh, train the telescope to compensate for those irregularities And that's what uh, training a drive does, and that's periodic error correction uh, is the way to do it. Yeah. I've told you before, I have a couple of uh, precision buyers uh, worm drives I bought somewhere yeah. years ago. Never have used them. They're still new in the box. Uh, the The worm gear is 8 inches in diameter, if I remember right, and the, uh, then the pinion... Uh, is the little worm gear that drives it and uh, uh, back in the day they had what they called synchronous drives uh, oh, yeah. or, or clock drives right and uh, the worm would turn once in a four minute period and uh, hello Marianne uh, they might put a 360 tooth gear to be driven by that worm and over the course of the day that adds up to uh, one rotation in 24 hours but as I've mentioned in the past uh, the difference between an earth day and a star day or a sidereal day the sidereal day is about 23 hours and 56 minutes long that's how long it takes for a star to rise from day to day 
and that mm -hmm. four minute difference is us as we orbit around the sun from day to day and what they would do to compensate is uh well you'd have the a little pinion drive that would still rotate once in four minutes but instead of 360 teeth they would make a 359 tooth worm gear and uh that difference adds up that one tooth adds up to four minutes difference so it gives you one rotation in 23 hours and 56 minutes instead of 24 hours and therefore in a perfect Crazy. world you could aim your telescope at a star and keep following it constantly over the course of a year the reality is not so simple yeah marianne is here hi marianne i don't know if she can hear us but uh she's at a hockey game I don't think she can hear us probably but it's alright alright let's see what we got here that there oh party. this here I mean what party hardy Marianne yeah she's gonna I think she's with her brother. Okay. No, Donald, you're not. Um, the uh, the stars in this particular case, the uh, the low focal length, wide field. It induces subtle uh, changes to the images at the far four corners of the sensor. So you're not seeing anything that shouldn't be. And what's important is that in this area right here, the stars all through the middle area, except for the extreme corners, the stars are perfect. Um, what we typically do is we'll typically actually crop uh, the sensor so that we're actually at like maybe like say that's even too much we, we, we I'll have to do it manually here I don't have to like for instance I'll get to a point all right so we'll do it like to here all right so that the stars won't have any effect every uh, every optical system has the chance of causing issues at the edge of the field um, and this telescope is the very first one of its kind that has the hyperstar, the, the F2 lens set up on it. There's no other Mead system, 10 inch F8 system that has these. This is the very first one. So ours is sort of a test unit. <laughs> um, and so uh, it really is uh, performing very well. <clears throat> Considering that we could have had a whole lot of trouble with this. And we had none, except for when it got when the, when the telescope collided with itself and uh, caused that lens to shift uh, like a fraction of a millimeter. But that's enough to make it go out of what it had, which was called collimation. And I had to run out there all the way to Arizona. I went into that building and I fixed the problem in literally 30 seconds. <laughs> 2,500 miles for a 30-second fix. That has to be a record. This isn't bad. This is looking pretty good. You know, what do we got? We got 10 stacked right here. Look at that. You see a lot of detail here. This, this, look at right here. You see this? Do you see that detail right there? I don't know if you can see that, Daryl. There's more dark nebula down here. Oops, sorry. Yes. Uh, there's the more nebula down here. I know that... At bottom, just left the center, there's a brighter area. Right here? A little bit. There's, yes, right there. And oh, there's some dark minute. stuff in that, if you could zoom in on that. Yeah, let me get rid of the name. You're talking about this here? Yes. Right here. Yep. All right. I had the name overlaying that. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, let's check that out. Uh, let's see if we can get to... 75% and we'll be at the center and we just have to go down now look at that there's a nice little tendril right there 
Let's drop down now. Wow, there's some nice stuff here. There's brightening there. These little things here, these little dots, these are guiding artifacts um, that uh, are the result of a dead pixel in the sensor. Right, and I remove those later. Here's your bright spot. I look at, and, and again, um, the internet causes these things to kind of look uh, pixelated sometimes. It's certainly not the camera. There's no pixelation at the camera. Um, but this is really pretty. And you'll notice, see those two little stars right there? I always wonder, like, this star right here, what if there's, that's a star that has uh, planets around it, and they're looking at us all as we're looking at them, hiding, you know, out in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of a nebula somewhere, and maybe there's life there of some kind. You know? We don't know. That star could be in the foreground, like way up here, and the nebula could be way back here. Okay? So it might not be affected by the high ultraviolet output of the stars that are causing this diffuse red glow that we see here. But do you see all the cloudiness? Do you see all the clouds and structure in here? This is incredible. And this is what I wanted to do tonight, was do a deep Deep subject view of this. This is 13 stack now. So is uh, your that's unsharp a lot. masking still on? It is. Why well, should it go off? What do you want to do? <clears throat> oh no! I just wondered. Uh, it's at 1.76. It yeah, that's fine. Yeah, which uh, on. okay, we'll leave it, it on still then. Still working. Yes. Alright, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back out to auto size here. And look at that. I mean, this goes up quite a bit more, remember. So we're going to have a very, very nice image that's going to be uh, blended. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop it down so that this is at the top and keep going south. And do more views. Actually, maybe. Hmm. Should I go to the left or should I go to the right? Uh, well, the walls pointing to the left, lower left. Yeah. So you want me to go down one more? You think? You're the you're the driver. Well, yeah, I'm I'm running the carnival ride. I get that, but you know what? As a as a rider on the ride, you have a right to tell me how fast you want to go. <laughs> uh, I'm the thinking. Wall, what we're calling here. the wall looks like it stops about three fourths of the way down. Right here, yeah. Maybe it but, continues. And see you got this that here? one brighter. Bright, mm -hmm. You got a brighter knot to the lower right and a brighter knot to the lower left. All right, I'm going to go down one more, one more uh, chunk, and we'll do that. So, first things first, we're going to pause this after 15 exposures. And I'm going to hit save. You're going to see it appear up there in the green bar. That's our FITS file saving. Do you need to rename that? Uh, no, I, that's a, okay. It's a separate image. It is, but it's going to go to a separate directory. Uh, actually, it may not, which is okay if it doesn't. Because it'll all be in the same directory. So, that's, that's fine. That's actually good for um, good for what we want. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. All right. So. Okay. So the ping is saved, uh, and the other is saved. So I can clear this. Get out of the stack. Go back. Make one second shot here, and go into. Okay, it didn't take. Let's do it again. All right, do the one second shot. Okay, and then do this. All right, and now we're gonna take these stars and put them up at the top. And continue down, because we know there's definitely some clouds down there. That's pretty cool. Mm 
Yeah. We'll be getting. You know, you're gonna. You're gonna basically see more of the. Um, Orion molecular cl molecular cloud complex when we do this. All right. All right. So this will be our last jog, and now. Um, first things first. Let me just get over here and return this to where it has to be. That's weird. Why I did that. All right, and then this guy has to return to where it belongs. Zing. Okay. All right. <clears throat> and that's not quite there yet. Okay, and now we have our guide star, and I can go to 60 seconds on this and watch it happen again. Oh, I cannot wait, man. I am just so excited. Starlink is... This, the unit has been shipped. Oh, thank you, Daryl, for putting up the link again. Yeah. Bobby Burgess asked for it. Hey, Bobby. I didn't even see you come in. Nice to see you. Hey, Papa Tom. <clears throat> uh, the the link to the server is also in every single description for all the for all the uh, streams as well. In the beginning, let the four-dimensional divergence of an asymmetric second-ranked tensor equal zero, and there was light, and it was good. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> Michio Kaku. All right. All right, there's our first shot. Wow, this is a rich area, Daryl. Look at that. Yes. Yeah. Oh, man. It's just never-ending, isn't it? Ronald asked, how is the connection speed for Starlink? Um, Ronald, the connection speed for Starlink is 20 times that of what we're using now out in the desert. 20 times faster than what we're using now. No, my mistake. Ten times faster. I apologize. Uh, Fifteen times faster. Yeah. So, it'll be more like um, real time. When I click something, it'll click it. I don't have to wait one or two seconds. And that's going to be the best. Ah. Little... Speaking of Starlink... <laughs> But that'll be gone sooner than later. Well, um, depends where you are, Ronald. Ronald asks, so if I move to Arizona, uh, I'll have internet if I order that? Well, yes, but you're, you know, depending on where you live, you'll have very fast internet anyway. Um, but the telescope is out in the middle of the desert, okay? And it's a green building. We're using solar power to get our power, courtesy of the owner of the land and his place that he has there. Um, and we're also, uh, you know, water's available too from a well that's deep underground. Uh, and the water comes out at 98 degrees, by the way, so... Uh, it's actually quite warm because it's a geothermal hotspot. Let's hope it's not a super volcano. No, it's not. Um, but uh, this location 
is actually a very, very good location. Uh, we're at around uh, 1,800 foot elevation, 2,000 foot elevation. So it's actually very nice. Um, and it gives us a lot. Oh, it's beautiful. Look at that. It gives us a lot of amenities. Uh, so we actually have free power from the sun, uh, free water when I'm out there. And um, as far as the f uh, internet, it's satellite internet. Uh, right now, our upload speed is <laughs> two megabits per second, 2.3 megabits per second via this Viasat system that's being used now. Now, when you had nothing else, that was the best thing since sliced bread. But Starlink comes along, and now you're looking at 40 megabytes per second upload and 100 megabytes per second download. That's fast. So it is 20 times faster, basically. Um, Look at the complexity in these clouds. Wow. That's just beautiful. It is. That's nice. Hmm. I'm really happy with the guiding. It's doing a nice job. But I'm sorry to make you guys sit through this, but I did warn you ahead of time we're going to be doing a, 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 a an in-depth look at the Horsehead region. So, you know. So we're going to actually put these all together. I have a program that's going to just link these all up together. And, um... It's going to be really nice. I'm going to have to do 15 uh, of these as well. <clears throat> when I put them together, I don't really care so much if the matching between the two is off a little bit. Uh, but we'll, we'll try and get close. Wow. Boy, that's something. Oh, we're literally looking at the giver of life in the universe. This dark nebula, this is the emission nebula, which is the hydrogen gas mixed in with all the dark dust. Everything you see in here that's black is dark dust. It's not a void in the gas. It's dark dust sitting up here where the dust, you know, the, the glowing stuff is behind it. See filaments here. And there's a mix. Some of it's behind, some of it's in front. So, but it's amazing. <clears throat> so this is the bottom of the wall that we've been talking about right here. Yeah. And it continues on down. And all this complexity is extremely prominent here. So what's, when making, put this, the, uh, what's making it... Uh, Glow? This far down. Well, uh, it, it's going to be a different star for sure. You know, it, it's probably uh, um, a star in the area here. Probably many different stars in the area here. You know, I don't know how far this star is, for instance, but it could be causing that to glow. Yeah. Uh, but it, it could be it could be Sigma Orionis. It's, it's Sigma is just out of the frame. Uh, so it still could think, be Sigma Orionis. Yeah, I would think they're up toward the top where you said you see, you know, like the bottom edge of the wall, we called it. Uh, yeah, right here. Sigma might be causing the emission, Just, at least that far down. Yeah, so it could be doing this one right here, maybe. Uh, maybe even this one, too. But here's what's interesting about this. See this little guy right here? Look at right here. This is little tiny area that's blue. You see that? So down here, there's a star that we probably can't see that's inside the cloud. And the dark dust in here is actually scattering the light from that star and causing this little blue glow. Now, it might be that star right there, but I can't really tell because we haven't zoomed in and looked at it in depth. But there's so much detail to look at and explore here. It's incredible. Let's see. Let's try. Uh, bring up our stack. Go to our brightness, you know, histogram setup. And let's see about just T. 
tipping the scales a little bit darker. Just a tad. There's a little modeling that we see there from this. And then what I'm going to do is try and bring out a little bit more of the detail by stretching it a little more. That looks like it pixelated a little bit, that last uh, movie it did. On, on the black one. It did. It did, but it didn't. It's actually temporary. Okay. JSCO77, what's going on, man? I think I saw you come in earlier. It's good to see you. <clears throat> I brought my heater up and it's sitting next to me now. <laughs> this is pretty. Look at the details in here now. Yeah. Our satellite trail is getting fainter, as as promised. Right there, it looks getting fainter. Yes, indeed. All right. This is. I don't know. I. <laughs> I'm so beside myself with how wonderful this stuff's coming out. Look, look at this right here. Look at that little area right there. That is just so beautiful. Let's zoom in a little bit. Now that we have 10 stacked images, we should be able to do that. Um, I don't need that. I need this. Let's go to 75%. And then let's move up to that. It's going to be pixelated for a couple of minutes. Again, it's the internet speed that's causing us to have issues with that. There we go. Look at this. Look at this beautiful region right here. Look at that. that you can see that that sharp delineation right there. You see that? Looks almost like a bow shock. It does. A bow shock is a, a, a shock wave that is created when something that has uh, some kind of impulsive force like a light right hits the gas and dust and instead of being flat it kind of bends it back and it sort of it causes the dust to be pushed back um, the, the the analogy that's often used is the the bow wave on a boat but that's the wrong that's the wrong analogy because the boat is pushing into the water it would be if the water is heading toward a boat that's not moving and goes and and, and and goes around the, the boat that makes more of a realistic analogy but that's even wrong as well oh Look at along, this the along the right side of that it's almost like I can see a fine light line yeah there is like right here places there and a little bit to yeah. the lower left of that yeah there. right here yep yep <clears throat> There's an awful lot going on in this region, and so we're probably looking at uh, stars' radiation that are causing some really interesting, uh, really interesting things. W13, this Ray. is uh, oh, this is all Nebulosity and Orion, uh, a little bit south of the Horsehead. Yeah, he didn't join us. If you didn't join us. Um, earlier we take a shot of the horse head then we move south took more shots in depth we move south did more shots in depth uh, we're doing 15 exposures of each section um, I think I did more of the horse head or maybe less I'm not sure but the idea is that in the end I'm gonna put them all together Wow That's the bottom. This is the top. Look at this right here. That's really cool. And move over a little. Mark, excuse me a moment, please. 
Yeah. Be right back. All right. <clears throat> Oh, look at that. Wow. Let's, uh, do a little bit of a color adjustment to help bring it out. There we go. And let's see what this wants to do. If we actually do bring out a little more. Oh, it's gorgeous. Wow, that's something. I don't know, man. This is something else. Let's see if we can stretch a little more data out of this. Wow. Hey, that's pretty cool. Thanks, weird guy. You're the horse head. That's right. And um, we actually took a picture earlier, if you were here. Um, Again, these are one minute exposures, taking um, 15 minutes each of them. So it's 15 exposures. We got one more to go here, and then we're going to stop this exposure. And then I'm going to, they overlap them so that when we can make one long continuous you know, uh, view of the horse head region. And look, we didn't have a whole lot of satellite problems. All right, so this is, okay, we've got 15, same as before. So now we're gonna pause this <clears throat> and save this. There we are. And then I'll save it exactly as seen so that you have the stack, which is the FITS file. Free readers are available to look at it. And then the PNG file, which shows exactly what you see here. And that's up on our server. So now we'll clear this. And come back out and get our... Uh, go back down to one second here. All right. And do our... Nice hybrid view and come down so that I can see what the telescope's doing. So I'm gonna move this out of the way. There we are. So there's the telescope there, telescope control right here. Me, hi. Um, this is the telescope computer, which you can see if I were to do this right now, then turn it on. All right. And then. <clears throat> we have uh, over here is our camera control system right there okay this is all our camera controls here really good yeah I mean you know something it's only getting better guys it's only getting better you know thanks to some of you who've donated to us I mean you've just you've made it possible for this to happen you know um, and we're becoming a 501c3 corporation and with the interest only in producing free educational outreach in astronomy. You know, if we do stuff for pay, it's going to be for specific organizations that want that. But never will I ask you guys to pay to be into this, okay? I don't believe in that. That's not public outreach. That's public, you know that's public reach into your pockets and I don't I don't want to do that uh, so I just want you guys to know that all right so here from this position I think I think I'm gonna go over to the right and I'm gonna move this over to the left side and we'll start doing that all right so we're gonna head west now <clears throat> okay And we're going to put those two stars, those two bright stars right there, over on the western edge of, or the eastern edge, rather. Uh-oh, what do we got there? Oh, my. There's something right there. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, we're in for it now. I'm liking that already. Is that a cloud? 
Is that a contrail? Oh man, it looks like a looks like a circular weird thing. I'm glad this is being recorded. This is strange. Look at that. That's an anomaly right there. A strange circular thing that's drifting across our view. That's a very, very odd thing. Curtis Horn. What's happening, brother? That is really strange. Wow. Well, you know what? We got it captured here. So let's make a note of the time. Um, it was somewhere between... Uh, 2303, uh, 2302, uh, and 2303, we saw this strange semicircular thing moving through the field. I don't know what that was. Really cool. Darn, okay. What I missed. And I believe you, you actually did miss something. We actually had this weird semicircular red thing that like a cloud, very faint, moved through the field of view. Uh, it looks like we're right at the top of the running man right here. Uh, and we're gonna, I move to the right now, and I'm gonna now do one minute and then move up again, uh, to the horse head again. And fill out the entire region. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> I asked people, it, it was actually 2301, I'm sorry, between 2302 and 2303, the time code. So you'll be able to see it. And I'm, I'm saying, what the heck is that? Okay, 60 seconds now. We're going to go in here again. <clears throat> and go back into the stack. And now we're actually doing another 60 seconds. You're going to see a glow at the bottom. That's going to be the top of the Running Man Nebula. And uh, possibly Running Man. I'm not sure. Uh, I have to look and see where we are here. Here we go. Because I actually, yeah, okay. So it'd be just around the top of the Running Man Nebula. And then we're going to go back up here. So we're doing this whole region in Orion right now. We're doing this whole region and making a nice deep shot one minute apiece. All right. And the other photos was, came out so beautiful. So I suspect these are going to come out very nicely as well. But we'll see. Yeah, you gotta check it out, Daryl. It's a, on the time code, it's twenty three oh two to twenty three oh three, and you see this weird thing moving through. It, it's definitely not a cloud. It's something else. Oh wow! Look at that. And there is the top of the Running Man right there. Okay. Uh, oh, twenty three oh two to twenty three oh three. Yeah, right in between. Yeah, uh, in. More close to 2303. Well, Isabella's not here, but... Uh... Well, I'll just write it down. We'll find it. It's funny. I don't see any comment uh, at your live stream. What do you mean? Well, I guess maybe because you're still live streaming. There is no... Uh, Comet area under uh, under the uh, video. Well, I'm I'm looking at it. I mean, I'm I'm watching the comments come in. In chat or no. in chat? Yeah. What are you talking? You talking? Oh, the regular comments. Yeah. Oh, okay. Vera Lucia Campos says, The beauty of the universe fills my soul with love. Well, I think that's and that's that's what uh, Usando Alweb was saying. Beleza del universo, anamora el alma. Yeah. It's okay, Bobby. I thought it was a beautiful phrase, but thank you. So here, uh, with the Running Man here, you can see the top of that beautiful dusty region. Um, and what's below this, of course, is the Running Man, and then below that is the Orion Nebula. But look at all this beautiful dust and emission nebula. We're getting more into some of the molecular cloud here as well. Um, so I think it's pretty neat, you know. PG says her stream is buffering. Do her, uh, 
they are do our you know a uh uh <laughs> hello um refresh uh well it's all molecular cloud isn't it we're just seeing more yeah illuminated areas yeah, we're seeing more of the dust being illuminated, especially by the Running Man area, nebula area here. Yeah. Again, this is Horsehead region. We'll do another one for Running Man nebula, uh, and then 15 frames, one minute each, and then we're going to combine them all. Hopefully, you know, um, at some point, you know, down the line here, we can combine them all into one big giant uh, panorama. I think that'd be really pretty. I see Donald Kendra just. said while I was away that uh, is it just coincidence that those small stars are following the curve of their bright area? Uh, I had noted that earlier, and I've asked that often before that you know it seems like on the edge of a bow shock or something, you'll see the uh, stars sort of helping delineate the curves. Yeah. Uh, you know, is that just coincidence or is that real? It's like I've said that about parts of the veil, if I remember correctly. Maybe. Boy, this is really pretty, though, huh? It is. And I purposely didn't... I purposely did not put uh, the running man in the view. I mean... In fact, if I could have, I would have been slightly above it, but I'm just trying to keep everything squared off. Then this sure. star is going to come down here. And then the next one is going to come down, and we should be back up at the horse head by then. When we finish, Sigma Orionis should be right around here. Uh huh. You know. Yeah. Wow. Alrighty, that's nice. Sort of like you're describing the area. Uh, it's like when you see Orion in a dark sky, and you look at uh, the area of his sword hanging off the belt. Yeah. That that uh, as you start moving up again, you're all in that area. I mean, the Running Man at the bottom of this image. That's uh, as you said, just above the Orion Nebula, and that's like the middle of the sword. And yeah. There's another area to the to the south of uh, the nebula that makes the mm -hmm. bottom of the sword. So you're sort of describing the whole area of the sword, maybe yeah. between the horse head yeah. and the sword. Looks like we got a little wind out here, causing some elongation here. Uh. Part of me wants to clear the stack and do this again. Let me just go look up here and see what we got. If it's the same, I'm going to clear the stack. Yeah, a little elongation there. Okay, yeah, you're zoomed in. That's quite a cluster of bright stars there just above the running man. Yeah, there is. And you're talking about these guys. Yes. Oh, that's beautiful. You know what? I'll deal with it. I'll deal with it. We'll let it we'll let it ride. We're into it for seven frames. Eight more to go. Actually just another another seven here momentarily.
look at that. That's just... Mm. Really, really pretty stuff. So see, this is why I wanted to do this, guys. I wanted to, I wanted to dig into the depths of the nebulae and see what else is going on. You know, Dean Bostador, what's going on? Ride, 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 we'll let you ride. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Good song. I was a drummer for years and I actually drummed to that song and played that song. Um. Yeah, and of course. Yeah, you know. Ride, 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 let it Bachman Turner Overdrive? Who did that? BTO? Yeah. I don't remember. I don't remember who did it. Isn't that sad? I remember every police song I ever did. You know? Yeah, that's, Dean says it was BTO. Yeah. Well, at least somebody remembered. Yeah. Uh oh, Vera found someone to talk to. <laughs> oh, you didn't have to retract it, Vera. It's okay. Yes, we want English, but you know what? If you want to say something, you can say it. It's not, you know, I'm not going to cause any problems for you. You're very good to our stream anyway and to all of us, so you know what? You get a pass. Not to worry. You're not saying anything bad. You hablo español también, pero uh, not a lot. So, but I still, um, I don't mind. Yeah, see, there you go. That's fine. She's saying, "Where are you?" Usando el web, where are you? Donde estás? Is dead. Yo estoy aquí. I'm here. <clears throat> That's pretty. Ten stacks so far. <clears throat> Look at the difference in the coloration here. You can see that this is uh, dust. And it kind of leads into a mission nebula up top here. You see that? And there's some here. And it's a mix. Okay, we said before it's a mix of that dust and hydrogen. They're all mixed together. And it just mat it, the matter is like how much is there? If, um, when you look at these nebulae, just give you an idea, okay, uh, in a cubic centimeter of air, okay, cubic centimeter of air, we have 7 times 10 to the 27th atoms, okay, in a cubic centimeter of air. Um, in these nebulae, to give you an idea how dense they are, in the densest part of these nebulae, like in here and over here, we're looking at, at most between 300 and 3,000 atoms in a cubic centimeter. So it's extremely rarefied. It's extremely thin. Um, not dense compared to an atmosphere on a planet. But it's dense when it comes to uh, having a light year's worth of that cloud floating out there that starts to gravitationally contract on itself. That's when we start to see things like star formation. And within the star formation, we also get planets forming in there as well. So that's why these dark nebulae are the seeds, S-E-E-D-S, the seeds of life in the universe. You know, these are uh, grains of sometimes carbon atoms that are stuck together, carbon-carbon molecules. There's diatomic hydrogen gas molecules out there. And what happens is, there's also a lot of silicate grains, you know, silica. Uh, you know, basically, silica with two oxygens is sand, right? So, silicon dioxide. So, um, if you just have a silicon molecule or atom and uh, it's out there, you might have a bunch of silicon atoms that, that combine to form this, this crystally 
looking um, uh oh reconnecting what's that mean don't do that to me yeah rut row we'll just wait to see what happens that is something that's gonna go away Ugh. luckily there's no bad weather coming So the silica, all right, uh, actually uh, forms a seed for things like um, uh, from ices, okay, of carbon monoxide, formaldehyde, uh, carbon dioxide ice, and uh, others. Okay, we're back, all right? So basically, what that means is that we end up with a um, we end up with a silica atom. Okay, silicon atom, a bunch of silica atoms to the, together making this this dust grain, um, and um, that creates a, a a foundation for all these ices that end up getting melted off, and uh, with with when they're near uh, uh, hot stars, and so what that does for us is it makes. Uh, uh, the, the dark, uh, these dark dust clouds are sort of like the uh, uh, kind of a melting pot of uh, materials that can go into forming planets and, and so forth. And that stuff gets liberated and it floats around in the cloud and becomes this, this beautiful seed material to, to make planets eventually. Oh, Vera, that's okay. Vera says, thanks, Mark. Usando El Web doesn't speak English. That's okay. So help him along. Help him or her. I think it's... Uh, I can't tell uh, from that whether that's a male or female. That's all right, Vera. Guide that person along. Help us out. That's fine. We welcome everybody. Curtis Horn says, Mark, I'm curious if you heard of the mock effect drive by Jim Woodward at Cal State Fullerton. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, I have heard about that, and um, I'm not sure what to think of it at this point. Um, but I know that, um, it's interesting. I haven't done a whole lot of, you know, real research on it, to be honest with you. Um, but I think that that's something that, um, and that, that's as interesting to me, for instance, as the, uh, the Casimir effect drive that's out there. Um, basically... Uh, the drive that doesn't require fuel, essentially. Um, sort of a misnomer. It does use fuel, but it's not... Um, it's certainly not the uh, kind of thing that... Uh, like a gas tank, where you have to fill it. You know? But actually, it, it's really cool. These drives, these futuristic uh, drives, are actually... They have potential applications to space flight, but it's really... Uh, it's really a long way off to become practical for us, I think. But I, Curtis, I'm going to check into that. Thanks for reminding me. Oh, that's cool. Very nice, Curtis. He's, he's working with them in his free time now. That's nice. And Vera says, only here have I seen these brown dust clouds. Incredible. Yeah, these, you know, it's hard to believe that there's so much pollution in the universe, you know. <laughs> this is interstellar smog. <laughs> you know. Curtis, I will. I'll, I'll let you know. Um, I can message you over on, on uh, cloudy nights, I guess. I don't know how often you check there. You can also message me on Facebook, too, actually, if you're on Facebook, and then we can start talking more directly. <clears throat> okay. Oh, we're at 17 frames. Went too far. That's okay. All right, let's do this. Okay, we're going to pause this now and save this as we see it 
and that's the uh, fits file that's our raw data and then we're gonna hit save and save exactly as seen and you're still calling it horsehead yeah it's all gonna be in the same place okay yeah all right and now we can clear this so we saved it and get rid of the stack I stacked up commands and I'm waiting for them to take hold boy it's taking a long time all right then I'll go back to one second come on you can come out there you go all right and then we'll do this get our hyper view in place okay and there we are and now this is the these three stars are going to come down to the bottom now all right so these are going to come off just just right near the bottom so we're going to go back up toward the north now <coughs> All right, and those three stars go down to the bottom. I need to have an overlap so that I can match the stars up because uh, the system that actually does the alignment is going to have to uh, see those stars. All right, so we'll come down a little bit more. There's Sigma Orionis. There's a satellite. You evil little monster, go away. Nobody likes you. Except me if you're Starlink. <laughs> okay. Here's Sigma. Here's the wall again. But now we're coming up the right-hand side. So we're going to actually come in here and do this. Uh, I'm waiting for the telescope to get its guide star. And do our 60 seconds. All right. You only went about halfway down with those three stars. Is that true? Yeah. I think you're right. Okay, I got to go up a little more. I saw the uh, wall and I stopped. And so these are going to be. A, it's going to be a little lower, yeah. <coughs> One more. There's the horse head. Okay. All right. All right. So now, uh, one more little jog. I want to. These are the three stars I was using, right? Yes. Okay. So that's believe. good. I'm gonna. All right. Well, let's just pull it down a little more. All right. And that's good. Okay. Now we'll let the telescope catch the guide star. <clears throat> and next thing I'll do is zoom in, make sure our focus is doing what it should do. You gotta let this clear up. Looks like we're gonna need to do a little bit of a refocusing too. Now, I looked at your approximate location on windy.com a few minutes ago said yeah. uh, there was uh, two knot wind so not a lot okay yeah but when you got the big sail sticking up there it just has to move a tiny bit you know mm. you know what I'm talking about that big the, the, that shield over the front of the telescope yeah, yeah. alright but you're right I'd rather have two knot than 15 knot all right, so now let's uh, let's see if we have to drop it a little bit. All right, I'm just gonna refocus here. I'm not sure I like that. Uh, 
there's a delay in the in the in the refresh guys which is what's making me wait so long between uh tries here sorry about that that doesn't look that bad does it that looks looks like it's pretty good right now <clears throat> Alright, we'll run with that. <coughs> okay. So it went from 61 or 2 <coughs> to uh, 54. So we dropped about just under 10 degrees. Okay, so that's done. Okay, then we minimize this. Come out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. That looks good. So now, uh, those three stars are there. That's our overlap. There's Sigma... Orionis <clears throat> and now we're going to we're going to come back here and go to 60 seconds again okay and start the stack <clears throat> Okay, here we go. Thanks, Curtis. I look forward to getting your message. Hey there, Fantasy. Fantasy's been here for a while, hasn't he? He said howdy just a couple of minutes ago. <clears throat> okay. But he was here for the Cal State Fullerton comment that Curtis made minutes ago. So, I thought I saw Fantasy here a number of times. You know, throughout the night. Okay, so what's kind of timer? Uh, Alright, we're at two hours. We're doing two hours. Okay, so there we are. This is the right side. This is the right side of this is what we're looking for. Oh, look at that. Okay, so <clears throat> let me let me just uh, correct the colors. I want to try and do all this before the moon comes up, which uh, we might be in a losing battle here. Okay. I don't know what time the moon rises is out there. Give me just a second, I'll tell you. Alright, thank you. <laughs> probably, uh... It's 9.30, the moon's probably just gonna be coming up around, uh... Um... 15 minutes from now or so. Maybe a little, maybe a little longer. That's a guess, though. I don't know. Moon rise at 9.34. So right about okay. now. All right. In a minute. <clears throat> okay, well, this last set of frames, this one and the one above it, probably going to be just a bit, uh, just a bit bright. Uh, but I'll keep trying it. Yeah, Fantasy, thank you. 8.30 Pacific, yep. Yeah. <clears throat> Fantasy says, I can see the light slowly growing on the horizon out the window. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, 
You know what? When you're in a dark sky site, uh, you see that light long before uh, the moon actually arises. Um, and that's something that it always is a uh, indicator that your night's going to get ruined sooner than later. Well, there's the horse head up there, guys. We're back up at the horse head. We're going to end up putting the horse head down here for our last set of exposures up at the top. Um, <clears throat> that'll probably bring Al attack in with the uh, flame at the extreme left side. But then we'll see uh, more details. So this is a uh, this is going to make for a nice set of images that we can then combine. And that's what tonight's about is doing the horsehead region. On other nights, maybe we'll do um, we'll do other regions like this. <clears throat> and it's neat because there's regions in space that we look in that look like there's nothing there until we take a long exposure. Like earlier, we saw these tremendous clouds of gas and dust, the Mission Nebula, these beautiful hydrogen two regions that are glowing softly by the light of, of stars nearby. Or not so nearby, I mean, ultraviolet light can be pretty powerful. See, this is Sigma here, and I think Sigma's responsible for lighting up all this here. Oh, I agree. As we said earlier, as far down as we can see the, uh, what we call the wall there, I, I suspect all that yes. Sigma. I believe so. Yeah. This is probably Sigma, most likely. This is probably Sigma. So as uh, you know, as this as this works out for us, um, you know, right now this looks kind of modeled. That's the internet speed that makes it look like it's not too too good looking. But once it comes in and starts to look good, it's gonna really look good, and it'll it'll look good in all the photographs that go up in the server. That's for sure. This sounds like the guitar that I like to do. I like blues guitar, so I, I play I play electric blues guitar. <clears throat> you know, there's epiphanies you have when you're learning something like that. Um, playing guitar, I took lessons um, from a guy named Dave Stoltz, fantastic guitar player, but. When I found out that he was friends with and plays all the time with Greg Allman, okay, and this is Dave, he's in like West Hartford, Connecticut. It's like you hang out with Greg Allman. I got like like nervous. I couldn't play in front of the guy anymore, so I ended up stopping lessons um, and learning on my own. Um, but I took lessons for a year or more with the guy before I found out that he was Greg Allman's buddy. Uh, and then all of a sudden I just, I don't know what it was, I felt scrutiny or whatever it was. Which is kind of weird for me, because I don't mind being on stage and performing and stuff. You know, doing uh, magic shows or, or talks like this or whatever. But it's um, interesting that when you look at uh, what, what things actually do cause you to be reticent to do something... Um, it, it was actually him knowing Greg Allman and being buddies that make me, you know, do that and make me like shy away. Um, so anyway, I learned on my own, but I ended up learning scales and things like that. And there's one scale I learned which changed the world of guitar playing for me, and that was the pentatonic scale. You know, I heard that. And I, I woke up in the middle of the night one night, not literally, it was 3 o'clock in the morning. And I came down here to this very office, and my guitar is right behind me. And I picked it up, plugged it in, and I started playing a blues song that was on the, that I had on a, an MP3 or MP4, rather. And I started playing to it. And it's like, I've got it. I've got it now. The fretboard is no longer a mystery to me. 
I know how it's built and it was like a dream that it came to me I just started going up and down the, the fretboard it made all kinds of sense to me um, and it was a creative thing you know what they say is left you know right brain you know a left brain thing um, I'm a creative person so that was a neat thing and so I tried to I tried to apply the epiphany that I had in music with what we do here in Sky Tour live stream. This is all led up to this. Sorry, I could could have just told that in the beginning, I guess. And that is, I show you things that are hiding in the dark. All right, like tonight's been looking at all the details in the dark, and I want to bring them to you so you can see that the universe is more than you might have thought it was. And hopefully, uh, this is doing it. You know, with Daryl's commentary and my commentary. Hopefully you guys are learning an awful lot about the universe tonight and seeing what's actually hiding out there. You brought back a memory for me. Uh, I remember Let's when I was a little, little kid, we were out one Sunday visiting relatives and uh, yeah. we were at a cousin's place and she was musical and she was on the organ, playing the organ. And, all of a sudden, she goes, Uncle Bill, why don't you play the guitar for us? And uh, uh, she or her husband or somebody got the guitar and gave it to my dad. And I was just a little bitty kid at the time. And he started mm -hmm. playing the guitar. And I didn't know he could do that. And <laughs> I was, was crazy, amazed, wasn't it? You know? And. Uh, <laughs> That's that, neat. Uh, yeah. That's a and wonderful thing. And I came thing. to learn later that uh, uh, before we were ever born, a uh, long time ago, he not only was a musician, he had his own band. Wow. And, uh, this is back in the days of live radio. Uh, he was on the stage band for a radio station back home. Wow. That's cool. And uh, neat. If if we went out and looked in up in the rafters in the garage, all his old bandstands were folded up. Uh, up in the really? rafters. Yeah. Wow. Well, you know, I had this old uncle. We called him Uncle Tuck, Clarence Tucker. And Clarence Tucker was a quiet guy. Lived in Bristol, Connecticut, with his wife B, my aunt B. And uh, they were prim and proper, you know, and, and Clarence always wore a, a suit jacket every day and, you know, looked nice, and they were church-going people, whatever. And I thought that was really you know, nice, and, and it was always warm in their house. I would always go there, you know, with my parents. And then I saw one time in his back room, he had a xylophone set up. And I was like, wow, Uncle Tuck, you play the xylophone? And he goes, oh, little... You know, and I said, can I play? Sure. And I played ding, 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 you know. And, you know, I just made stupid noises on it, right? Um, I had to be probably 10, maybe 11. Well, anyway, my mother said, well, you know why we're here, right? And I said, why? Because we're going to go watch Uncle Tuck play in his band. I went, he plays in the band? Yeah. So we went to see him on the green that evening. And he was playing with a band, and his he was featured because they turned all the lights out, and they put a black light on his mallets, and all you saw were the little balls bouncing up and down, because he had two in each hand, and he was playing them, and it was like following a bouncing ball, except there were four of them. Uh -huh. Absolutely incredible. And uh, I didn't know it at the time, but it was such a big deal to my parents, and I didn't understand why this was such a big deal. And when we got home, uh, I just went to school the next day and carried on with my life. And in later years, I found out why it was such a big deal. That band was the Benny Goodman Band. And he wow. was the xylophonist for the Benny Goodman Band. <laughs> and he had a featured thing where he played. There was a name for it, too. It was like um, something in the dark or glowing something. I don't remember what it was. But he actually was the, uh, a feature performer 
in in the in the band and I couldn't believe it and then one day um, when I knew all this I asked uh, my uh, Cl- my uncle Tuck had passed away and I asked my aunt B whatever happened to the xylophone aunt B because I would love it it's a percussion instrument after all I, I would have loved it to carry it on you know and she says oh when Tuck died I threw it away <clears throat> it's like oh. it's like oh my god it's a piece of history I couldn't be mad at her, right? Because she was devastated. I was just lost. I understand, you know. But uh, interesting that he was in, he was in that band as a featured performer. I had no idea. Just like you didn't know your dad could play the guitar, <laughs> yeah. you know. Well, it turned out my dad he uh, played the guitar. He played the trumpet. He played the bass violin. Wow. The, you know, the bull fiddle. Uh, yeah, and uh, <clears throat> he was sort of like the uh, country western musicians in uh, the movie The Blues Brothers. You know, we play oh, yeah. both kinds of music, country and western. <laughs> <laughs> he was a country musician. The radio station he was on was a uh, country music station, and they were the live band for the station. Yeah, Donald Kunzer. It was the it was the big band. Um, and you know what else? Um, when I was in college getting my astronomy degree, I was I learned to play drums in college. And my drum instructor was a guy named Chris. And I'd go to Chris's, it was like a dungeon. It was below the campus on, in these steam tunnels that he had this, this uh, room where his drum setup was. Uh, and he rented that little space from the college and it was always like 110 degrees in there, high humidity, uh, terrible for drums. But <clears throat> he would play in there, and I would know if he was in there just by putting my ear to, to the tunnel anywhere on campus. And I could tell if Chris was in the drum in his drum room practicing. And I would run down there and practice. And he'd let me practice on his set. Well, it was a lot of fun. I had a great time, uh, you know, playing there and, and everything and I learned an awful lot from Chris and um, I took lessons from him for like three years out of four that I was in, in the school and um, Chris went on to uh, found another very popular drumming group called Blue Man Group <laughs> he was uh, he and two other guys founded Blue Man Group Chris Wink um, and uh, I thought about auditioning for Blue Man Group at one point in the past, thinking that might be kind of cool. But I, uh, I just wanted to stick with the science, you know, and, and uh, it would be, it'd be so demanding, and that's it's all I'd be able to do, and all you would do, and I just, I, it's not all I wanted to do. So I, I basically said, now, I'm gonna stick with my goal, you know, I really want to bring astronomy to the world, and that's that's so that's what i did i do not regret it you know because that's that's something that would not have been uh uh, the the life for me in the end i wouldn't have enjoyed it overall you know but what what amazing uh people that we all meet in our lives you know oh yeah i was really proud to have met him i knew him before he was in Blue Man Group, I knew him when he was just Chris, you know, and not the Blue Man guy in the end on the right, you know. Um, I'm but they here started trying it. to imagine Blue Man Mark. I, I could, yeah, imagine no hair. I mean, no, that wouldn't have worked though because I've got this wicked scar across the top of my head. Um, but they wore a uh, skinhead, uh, skin wag, you know, skin mask, uh, masks on the top of their head, so. Yeah, that's right, Donald. Fun with PVC. And what's weird is, after I got out of school, I started making didgeridoos, because I play the didge, with PVC pipe. And I noticed that when you give the bum, 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 that noise, that was so cool. I really enjoyed that. Uh, and so I meant I, I ended up doing a lot of it. And uh, I've made didgeridoos for people all over the place. You know, they really, uh, it's really fun. I'm going to pause this because we've got uh, 17 stacked. All right, we're going to save this view. We have one more to do after this, I think. Yes. Okay, 
that's our raw stack and now we're gonna save exactly as we see it All right and okay and now we can clear this quit the stack and now we're gonna move the stars of importance down further and get this last shot we do have the moon up so we're gonna be careful we're gonna try and do this as much as we can there there's Sigma we're gonna put Sigma way down here so let's get our finder mode activated here <clears throat> there we are Now, that made me think, uh, uh, again, remembering back to I was just a little bit of kid. Uh, mm -hmm. Some men came to the house after dinner one night. Yeah. And my, my father broke out a bull fiddle. I had never really? seen this thing before. Well, and, what's a bull uh, fiddle? <clears throat> you know, a bass violin. And, uh. Uh, he opened it up, I didn't showed know. it to them, and uh, they bought it and took it away. Wow. And, and uh, I guess, you know, that was him getting rid of part of his past. Wow. Wow, that's pretty crazy. Yeah. And again, that, you know, it goes back to the man he was before we were ever born. Yeah. I could say more for that, but I won't. Well, that's all interesting, though. <clears throat> well, I, uh, our oldest brother told us one night, uh, he was back home visiting, and you never knew the father I knew or that we knew, you know, the older kids in the family. What a... They called him Wild Bill Mason back in the day, and uh, <laughs> Wild Bill Mason. <laughs> and he was a wild and crazy guy, and had wow. a very happy-go-lucky, and you know, a musician. And him and all my aunts and uncles, I guess they were all about <laughs> party animals back when they were young. <laughs> Not the guy I knew growing up. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you have kids, you settle down, and you don't do as much of that, right? Okay, so now the shot takes us, Horse of Nebula here, uh, this greenish cast is the, the uh, light that's brought in by the moonrise, and this is Alnatak here, and this is Alnalam, it's the middle star uh, in Orion's belt. So we're actually that close to it, but we have all this stuff out here that we're trying to grab before the moonlight makes it impossible to grab it. So first things first, we're going to do a color balance if we can. Um, all right. And let's see if we can get a little bit better dark rendering here. Okay. <clears throat> all right. So we're going to let this one cook for a few minutes. Eva Glenn, uh, you're welcome. You said thanks for everything, but I'm not sure what it is I'm doing other than just taking pictures, right? And just bringing you along with Daryl here. I mean, uh-oh. We got a tumbler right here, I think. Actually, that could... If that's not on this next frame, I could actually say that's a meteor if it's not on the next frame so let's find out if it's on the next frame over here uh, with, with brightness then that's a tumbling satellite but if it's not then that's actually a meteor that we caught I can't wait to see we got five seconds to wait <laughs> okay meteor or satellite and the answer is oh satellite it just made a little tiny motion there. Very cool. Yeah, why don't you hit those thumbs up, guys? 
know, get us going. You know, we want to actually, <clears throat> we want to get up to 10,000 subscribers and uh, opens up a new world for us to do new things you know, on YouTube. And uh, we enjoy this. <clears throat> Papa Tom, thanks, man. I think he probably already left, huh? But good night, Papa Tom. <clears throat> I missed that. Yeah, those are great remembrances you came up with earlier, Daryl. And, you know, and people oh, appreciate them, I see out there. There's more that uh, I won't get into. Family yeah. dynamics kind of things. Probably too personal yeah. to talk about. One of my sisters was the only one of the kids uh, who was allowed to pursue music. Okay. And, uh, oh God, they got her a piano and uh, huh? a violin and, uh, oh geez, what all. She wound up, uh, uh, she was a drum captain for her girls' drum and beagle corps in our high school. She was a hell okay. of a drum player. And uh, she also took up playing the bassoon, you know, the big, uh, the bass yeah. instrument. And yeah. uh, for the time, that was considered so remarkable that uh, they made her a member of the uh, town orchestra. Oh, that's cool. That's neat. But our father wouldn't let any of the boys try to uh, take up music. I wonder if that goes back to uh, his experience doing it. Um, well, that's the family dynamics part. That was our mom's doing. Hmm. I want you to be there for your loved ones. I don't want you to be away from the house for months on end or whatever. Uh, it's something probably... like that. I mean, she was she wanted him to stop being a party animal, I guess. Mm hmm. And the father I knew was a carpenter. <clears throat> oh wow. My father owned a laundromat in town. But he did everybody's laundry. He made his living by washing other people's dirty clothes. Mm. And he did it manually. <clears throat> and I used to work down there folding towels because he was also what they called the towel man. He would go to high schools and junior highs and locker rooms and pick up all this, this these wet, soaked, dirty towels on the floor and wash them, bundle them up nicely and bring them back for them to mess them up again and go back and do it all over again. And I would go with him to pick up the dirty towels. And um, he would make me stand away from the towels, wouldn't let me touch them. He did all the work. Um, and uh, But I was there. And he enjoyed having my company there, and I enjoyed being there with him. Um, and he was known as the towel man. And uh, <clears throat> it was a... <clears throat> Excuse me. It was very interesting because the dynamic was such that everybody knew who he was. Everybody knew this guy. And they all thought the world of him. Um, and, um, and then comes along his son, who's uh, me, okay. A bratty kid, <clears throat> but but precocious and, and want to explore the world and and find out new things and so uh, I, I, I think I must have run him ragged, you know. Uh, he, never, he never told me, he never discouraged me from doing it. He always encouraged me to go to school. You go to school, you get a better education than I did, you know, that kind of thing, right? And, uh, and, and when I, it was time for me to go to college, I couldn't afford to go to any kind of an Ivy League school, you know. I was accepted at Yale. I couldn't go. I couldn't afford it. You know, I didn't get enough uh, financial aid and, and scholarships for that. Um, 
So I went to uh, Wesleyan University, uh, Wesleyan in Middletown, Connecticut. They had a great astronomy program. And um, for me to go to school, he had to sell his business. And can you imagine uh, ending your livelihood and deferring the payments for four years and living on crackers and bread, okay, so that your child could go to school? You know, you never forget things like that. And I think part of that is why I like to pay it forward as well and give back. You know, I think that made me into the kind of person that I am, which is one who wants to see people learn things. And I don't think enough of myself, you know, doing, you know, making a living. I just want to make sure other people understand and get a good, good understanding of what I'm doing and a good, good, good understanding of the concepts. You know, and you know, when you get like that, you know, you may talk a lot, you know, and I may dominate a lot when we talk and all that. But really, it's about getting the information out there. Um, I'm just a talker. Yeah, I am. And, okay, it's a curse. It's a gift. Whatever. But I do like to try and um, give back what, you know, my dad gave to me. I could never ever repay that you know to anyone of course he passed away a long time ago um he got an infection in a heart valve and he actually uh, had to and that killed him unfortunately and then a year to the day after that i needed the same operation now that was just too too much for my family and we just couldn't do it in the same hospital so they arranged to have me do it in another state in another hospital with a top guy in the country and that was just like, wow, you know. So um, that was when I was like 34 years old. And then when I was 55, I'm 61 now, guys. I'm old. <laughs> but when I was 55, uh, I had it again. And this time I had it at Mount Sinai. And that's the surgery that kind of went sideways. Uh, but I'm back. And um, so it really comes down to, you know, all the things that you know we are that daryl is that i am that you guys are it's all based on everything we've experienced you know we are who our past is yep. right and and that's that's really true i think so you know that my past has made me into someone who wants to be giving and you know you know give the gift of astronomy if i can to the world you know uh, so out of necessity, I guess that makes me kind of a big mouth talker, <laughs> you know, because you gotta do that somehow, right? <clears throat> but I enjoy your camaraderie and your company too. It's really nice. Oh, Raymond, thank you. You know, we uh we all have our our strengths. You know. Daryl said it before: brevity is the soul of wit. I, I'd like to learn that lesson someday. <laughs> All right. Read Hamlet sometime. That's where, that's where the line comes that's, from. Yeah, you told me. <laughs> and the, the irony of it is, brevity is the, is the soul of wit. Uh, yeah. Polonius, uh, the father of Ophelia, Hamlet's girlfriend, yeah. He said it, and he was the most long-winded guy in the uh, in the play. <laughs> well, <clears throat> well, I'll get it someday. Hey, Zadarek, not a problem. Kingus, you're the man. <laughs> Ronald says, Mark, I thought you were younger than me. <laughs> I'm older than both of you. Oh, it's okay. You're 62. I'm 61. Uh, not hardly. Oh, you know what, though, Ronald? I can tell you right now. Um... Yes, you can say all the same things, ages and number, etc. But there's something about it that 
I've never had a problem with. You know, I don't have a problem getting older. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, things hurt a little more here and there, <clears throat> but I am, I, I've got, I've got big plans. <laughs> you know, got another observatory to build. You know, got another telescope to put in this observatory. <clears throat> You know? <clears throat> okay, we're at 13 images here. We're two images from ending this stack uh, sextuplet. Yeah, septuplet would be seven. Sextuplet, yeah. This stack sextuplet is almost officially over. But we started and ended, uh, the horse head was more centered before. So we went down, over, and up. And we're finishing this out. We're gonna make this nice, big, blended uh, panorama of all this. Oh, Dean, that's very kind of you to say. Yeah, we do, don't we? We, we actually, you know, I, you know, we recognize everyone's humanity, you know? We know that people, you know, enjoy this, and we don't ever take advantage of anyone's kindness, you know. I'm just uh, very happy that uh, people enjoy it. And we have a great community. That's a good way to put it, Dean. <laughs> oh, Raymond, man. <laughs> More scopes. That's funny. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. That's uh, outrageous and fantastic. Thank you, Vera. See that, Daryl? See what Vera I says know. about you? Yeah. Oh, she said about That's Bob nice. Mother. Yeah, yeah, but you know. She was <coughs> stressing you. <laughs> Well, then I'm a slightly younger one. <laughs> Raymond's been very kind to us, more than he needs to be, and you know, it's very much uh, accepted with grace and honor. Thank you, Raymond. Um, but he uh, he did something nice for us for Skytro livestream, and so I sent him two of our 3D printed craters, one from Mars, one from the Moon, um, and he has them on display uh, proudly at his residence, and I think that's that's really cool. But uh, I don't I I do not forget when people do nice things for us. You know, I've been in the position where I've done nice things for people, and they just like <laughs> as if it never happened. You know, I don't need recognition and sometimes I'll do it anonymously right but when they talk you know who you're talking to you know whether they actually liked it or like or felt humbled by it or whatever you know and that's why I have a problem with the the Holly weird crowd you know they act like they got to where they are because of their stick to it no you got a break somebody gave you a, an opportunity you know, and I always say it, you know, I'm where I am because I actually had the privilege of standing on the shoulders of giants. Okay. And that's something that everybody in this stream and Daryl and myself, we've had the opportunity to do. You know, no one is self-taught everything they know. No one. It comes from somewhere else. Somebody gave you that opportunity. Daryl was given an opportunity to be an engineer. And he put that to excellent use working in the mines. Okay. Right. Not the spice mines of Kessel. I went to the school of hard knocks, okay. Yeah, he did. I but think it pleased my father that uh, I was the blue collar kid in the family, just like he was the blue collar father. Yeah. We all, well, there were seven kids, and uh, I guess six of us went to college. Uh, mm -hmm. I thought I wanted to be an artist when I grew up. 
<laughs> well, in a sense, it. maybe you were. Well, I put my creative okay. impulse into my work, uh, as I, I've said probably. Uh, I mean, I, I've done a lot of design and fabrication work over the years, and I've done some really neat stuff, but... Uh, uh, sort of Your binocular telescope. Impulse. Your binocular telescope stands alone as an amazing achievement. Yeah. So, my friend Jay made a binocular telescope, and it was two five-inch refractors strapped together. Okay, and on a large aluminum extension ladder at the other end of which it was in a fulcrum you know another ladder that he had it sitting over on a, as a fulcrum and at the other end he had weight training weights hanging from it just the right amount like 20 pounds or whatever and so you could just just nudge it and move it up and down and check out stuff in the sky uh, and you know, it looked like a kludge, but man, when you used it, it was the most spectacular thing in the world. Kind of like that other wooden telescope that looked like a, you know, uh, something out of the out of Wild Wild West or something that you saw. You know, so yeah. it's like everybody's creativity. It it actually everybody's very creative, you know, but they sometimes don't have the means to to uh, show it. You know, don't have the means to employ uh, expensive things, you know. So, um, they do with what they have, you know. And I think what you did with your binocular telescope was beautiful for what you had to what you used. And it was probably something that was well within the tolerances of a modern telescope. You still have it, don't you? I do. And I bet it's beautiful. I bet it still works just fine. Needs to be dusted off. Yes, it does, Daryl. <laughs> well, I, uh, <clears throat> I have a bad habit of losing interest in things after I do them. I mean, yeah. looking back, I'm more proud of uh, things I did for work that I put myself into and the whole thought mm -hmm. was that you know my stuff worked and it worked the first time and yep. uh, I helped make other people's lives easier because that was my That's job. That's cool. The sister <clears throat> I mentioned earlier she probably followed her dreams better than anybody in our family. She really? went to college she wound up becoming a teacher she did that for a few years. She was an art and English teacher of junior high school, and uh, she figured out okay. she really wasn't cut out to be a teacher, so she went back to college and went to law school. And wow. She got a law degree. She uh, met another lawyer in school, and they got married. They both became partners in their respective law firms, and wow. she wound up becoming a federal judge. Wow. And then she retired at the ripe old age of 46 years old. She just stayed wow. home and That's plays, the, plays the stock market now. Impressive. Very impressive. But is she a Jedi yet? Impressive. Most impressive. But is she a Jedi yet? <laughs> Actually, to do that right, it's got to do it with a glass. Impressive. Most impressive. But yeah. are you a Jedi yet? She's eccentric. I don't know about a Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> you know, poor people are crazy. Rich people are eccentric. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's rich, true. So. I guess that's true, huh? Yeah. Wow. Well, folks, we did it. We did our, we did what we're gonna do tonight. Let's look at one so, more thing. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Okay, what do you want to see? <laughs> what I told you earlier. Go over by Sirius. Yeah. 
serious, yeah, and we'll go check it out. Well, the moon is up though, so um, and it, it's a. Uh, it may not be there. Uh, it may not be as bright, but we'll check it out. Right. We're not going to tell you what it is, folks. Nope. Uh, what's its designation? Oh, uh, look, if you want to keep it a secret, what it is, uh, let's uh, give them well, the uh, the uh, proper name for it. Okay. I mean, I, I could say what it's. You know, it's fun name. Is. No, what's, no, what's, what's the would, uh, NGC number? SH2-308. Oh, that's a sharp list. Okay, SH2-308. That's right. <coughs> sharp list is a catalog. Okay. Eight degrees, eight degrees <coughs> south of Sirius. Okay, well there it is, and I would say that this is the dog right here, so let's see if we can see it. Here we go. It's probably going to go to Sirius <coughs> as the star that it uses. Yeah, so that, that uh, gave looking, away anyway the title of that. Well, uh, no, it didn't. <clears throat> oh, it's not using Sirius. I'm going to change the name up here. SH dash two. Oh, no, SH two dash three oh eight. All right. Oh. Come on, really? And it's centering a uh, star from the Smithsonian Astrophysical Catalog, SAO number. <coughs> there we go. Well, we'll see if we can see it. It's supposed to be... Uh little over half a degree across and uh, magnitude six I would think it would show up it should be here um, <clears throat> and I can see that the coordinates it thinks it has are not correct for it so I'm going to have to uh, I'm gonna have to uh, head to the west a little bit to catch it <coughs> <clears throat> so let's do that. Uh, come along. Uh, you just haven't synced lately. No, no, actually the coordinates are right on the money. It's just that the database has errors. <clears throat> it has nothing to do with the sync, believe it or not. Because the telescope, if you look at the right ascension and declination you'll notice that your right ascension and declination is actually coming in uh, to this location. All right. Let's see. Is that where it is? Actually, you know what I gotta do? I just gotta quickly go enable. I say quickly. Nothing's quick when it doesn't want to listen because it's so slow and let it over here in the wrong place okay ah, okay let's try this again okay DSO <coughs> and we're gonna do sharpless catalogs right sharpless catalog right there that's all I'll do for now and we should see it here at that point if we ever get out Come on. There it is. Okay. So, let's go a little bit more to the west and see. I see something over here. Hmm. 
Hmm. Can't really tell. <clears throat> Theoretically, that's where we are. This is that one more object, guys. See, that's what happens, you know? I tell you we're going to do one thing, but am I telling you the truth? Mm, kind of. I assume right. that bright star there, Udra, whatever it is, is uh, what we're seeing in yeah. the field. I believe that's correct. Yeah. So we come down here. <clears throat> and that should be Udra. So we want to go up a little bit. And now the moon is up. It's a, a uh, waning gibbous moon. So it's pretty bright. But let's not, see. Not too far. No, I'm not. That's, that's Udra there. Yeah, I suspect it's in the field. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to do, <clears throat> do a one minute shot. It might be better on a dark night. I agree. Because this is uh, going to be blue, isn't it? Uh, that image I sent you, I didn't see what... Uh, if that was like Hubble Pallet or what. Okay. Saw two different images of it. Both of them were blue. Oh, maybe yep. it's oxygen. Well, it's... <clears throat> these things aren't necessarily just oxygen or hydrogen. Sometimes there's a mix uh, there. It yeah. depends what the star yeah. was made with. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, just so... Going, going on the assumption of what the colors were in the images I showed you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but if you notice where the telescope's pointing, it's pointing due south right now. It's pretty not not quite south. It's a little bit a little bit more than south. Toward the southeast a little bit. Southwest, isn't it? Actually maybe southwest I meant, yeah. Yeah. I meant southwest. Okay, so let's see if it's in the field. Here we go. Um, I think it is. All right. It is. I think that's it right there. But how would I know that? I have to go and I think there's some more of it right there. So let's do this. <clears throat> and do a color correction, which will really help because it's going to get rid of the green background. There you go. And now you can see some of it right there. Barely. Some more of it right there. Yeah, yeah it's, don't worry. It's supposed to be 35 it, minutes across, so that'd be about a <clears throat> third of the way from the top <clears throat> to bottom. You yeah. Know, if your field is one and a half degrees high. It is. It's, uh, and that means guys it means uh, that we're looking at three full moons tall and four full moons across that's how big this sensor is all yeah, right and, and what we want to do here should be just over a half a degree a little over yep. a one lunar diameter maybe that is mm -hmm. it it's very ghostly i see something very oh it's there green, I, very faint green i clearly rain. see it i clearly see it <clears throat> right there yeah oh Rather disappointing, though. Oh, well, well, it's a moonlit night. Mm. And we have one image stacked. It gets better and better. I can make this look good. Don't worry. Don't be so quick to judge it disappointing now, Daryl. We can fix this. Alright, let's... uh Let's do this. Well, I picked a fine time. I need to step away for just a moment. Excuse me. Okay. <clears throat> yep. 
You know what I should do? I should. This is called the Dolphin Nebula, by the way. Uh, I should get an actual image of the Dolphin Nebula, put it up on the screen, and say, "Well, we're finished. See what happened? I told you I can make it look good." <laughs> <clears throat> I didn't mean to unhide her. I tried to hide her. Please rehide her. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I did it. Okay, I see there's a little behind. All right, sorry. So we're looking at this guy right here. Um, <clears throat> it's a, uh, a nebula that's uh, the result of a wolf rayet star, which is one of these stars that blows off its outer layers. Um, and... The center is brightened here because of the moon. All right, the center is very, 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 very sensitive. I'm sure that on a moonless night, this will be stunning, Daryl. This is a fine object. We just have to, we just have to take our time with it. Don't make it feel bad about itself. <laughs> All right, so this is a little brighter. Let's see. <clears throat> yeah. We're fighting moonlight, too, and the moonlight is adding a bluish-green tinge uh, to our imagery, which makes it kind of difficult. But we might be able to just do a couple little things here. Okay, I'm going to post the picture of it. Uh, All right. The bright star we saw toward the bottom, this picture looks like it's rotated about 90 degrees. And uh, the brightest star that I think we would see above it in your image is evidently the wolf red star. This guy right here. I'm not looking. It sure looks like it. That looks like it right there. Yeah, give me just a second. All right. Uh, okay. Well, come on, Skype. Does your computer still fail you? Whoops. Uh, I lost Skype somehow. <clears throat> you still, well, still here? here. Yeah. Huh. Well, let's not let's not worry about it right now. Uh, okay. Okay. Let. I'm gonna go to the left screen here, guys, so I can show you. This is the object that we're imaging right now. See that right there? That's uh. That's why it's called the dolphin, dolphin head. And that's oh, the star. Okay. That's the wolf red star. You have the picture up on your. I do. Yeah. So the bright star we see. Okay, and you've got it up. Yeah, there too. Uh, There's the bright star we're seeing in our image. I think. Uh, the one we this called guy. Udra, whatever it said on uh, Stellarium, is the yep. bright star there at about 2.30, right there. That's this guy. And then... Uh, and that's the wolf that's, red star. That's at the bottom in your image. And so the second brightest mm -hmm. star we would see would be above Udra in your image. Can you switch back to your yep. image? Yeah, I'm going. Okay. Uh, so we just need more time yeah. uh, okay, to so do this. Okay, so star at the bottom, the star directly above that, that's the wolf red star. Yeah. And we can barely see, very ghostly, but you can see the ring mm -hmm. shape. 
Yeah, I think that, as I said, we just need to uh, image this without a moon. Yeah. Because r- reflection nebulae and uh, oxygen nebulae like this, these suffer with moonlight because the moonlight is practically the same color. So yeah. it, it dampens out a lot of that light. It makes it really hard to see. Well, look, I won't save it, but we're going to come back to this. Uh, so thank you. Well, what? no need to salve my feelings. That's fine. It'd be nice to see this again in the dark of the moon. And we will, because then we don't have this central brightening. It'll be much better. Okay. And uh, we. We'll, this is a one-minute shot, too. So yeah. uh, at a good size gain. All right. Well, hey. Okay. A well, very good. This is a very good object, Daryl. Don't old. feel bad about yourself. <laughs> well, I hate to end on a down note. I was That's not a down right. note. We had a beautiful, uh, beautiful night here. Okay. You know? So let's see here. Not this guy, okay? But let's try... Alright, it's uh, 1230. So let's look for uh, one more object, okay? Just one more. Jeez, you guys. <laughs> um, where else can we go? Go to Thor's helmet. I bet it looks okay. It's the same color, though. It's going to end up being, you know, it's going to be washed out again by the moon. Okay. So I don't want to do Thor's helmet tonight for that same reason. But there's a lot of Sharpless catalog stuff. Okay, let me back out a bit. Let's go to Sirius and burn out our retinas. Okay. I'm going to oh, come up here. you could do the uh, little beehive again. That looks nice. It did, didn't it? <clears throat> yeah. M41. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So let's go do that. Which is right there. Actually, it's really close. No, it is. So I might, I might just be able to move our telescope up there. Let's change the... Um, oh, see, they did that to me now. Come on. Let's do this. Let's get this... Um, set the speed to this here which is 1.5 degrees per second and just hit north <coughs> like this oh uh and set this to one second instead of 60. <coughs> all right and then we'll just do that and now hey here we go now we are in the know we're in the region so let's take this and let's move over now to the west one quick pop gets us over there okay maybe a second quick pop here we go and then we're gonna change to our typical motion so we can actually get in there nice and easy <coughs> should be in the field now <coughs> should be to the right there it is <coughs> let's do it again that's beautiful the sky really has brightened up yeah <clears throat> Usually our one second photos are dark background or at least a a, a a slightly more muted background. Yeah. Or are you on your hyper setting already? I am. Okay. Yeah. So this 
This cluster has got to have at least a hundred stars in it. Maybe more. Okay. Yeah, 50 to 100 stars. <clears throat> okay. Contains about 100. Right. Several red giants. Right. Uh, blah, blah. Some white dwarfs. Blah, blah. Okay, we're going to do a 20 second photo of this cluster. All right, and we'll get out of <clears throat> our hyper view and go into our live stack view that's beautiful <clears throat> fantasy thanks man you like to look at clusters and telescopes yeah me too all right now let's uh let's add some depth there we go and set the color properly there we go. <clears throat> See the red, the red stars I mentioned. Yeah. yeah, there they are. We saw those the other night too. Yeah. And now let's actually slide the black level over to the peak and darken up the background. There we go. Ah. That's really pretty. It is. All right, I'm going full screen here for. I'm doing this for you, fantasy. Because you say you like clusters. This is this is for you. <clears throat> Thank you for indulging me. No, it's fine. It's great. We'll get back to the dolphin, and it'll look beautiful when we actually do get a chance to image it in the dark. Okay, go a little bit more. Yeah, see now, now look at this cluster. Look at that, that's like a jewel box. That's a jewel box right there. That's what I like. <clears throat> Thanks, Ray, I'm glad you like it. Oh, that's one. I'm, what I brought up our last stream, uh, some yeah. recent stream. It seems like we always go around it instead of look at it. You know, it's right there under Sirius. Yeah, well, I'm glad we did. Yeah. Measure forty-one. Beautiful. Uh, <coughs> it's a beautiful, actually stunning, stunning little cluster. <clears throat> There we go. Well, we're going to save this, too, by the way. We're not going to not save it. You know. Oh, Petita, thank you. Petita likes it, too. You know. You know that old saying, that little silly saying, diamonds are a girl's best friend? Remember that? I don't know if we could get away with saying that these days. Maybe you could. But I think clusters are my best friend. <laughs> okay. Well, they're just like jewel boxes to me, and it just looks stunning. It's like you never get tired of looking at them. You wonder, you know, what's going on? There's a lot happening in these clusters. A lot. You know, because the stars are actually gravitationally bound to each other, and so they're, if you looked at them in fast motion, they're doing this. They're all moving around each other and orbiting each other, and some of them will eventually get, get sent out and, and ejected from gravitational whipping. All right, but right now they haven't, um, and maybe there's some reason that hasn't happened. Uh, but it's pretty cool. Uh, what I always liked about clusters like these, it's uh, it's the eye instead of the image. Uh, it's that dynamic range thing again. Uh, when you look at a cluster mm. like this in the eyepiece, it really stands out against the background stars. And uh, oh. because of the 
lack of dynamic range of the image, you kind of lose it uh, against the background stars and images. It mm -hmm. stands out a lot more in the eyepiece than it does in the, in the camera. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> anyway, there you well, go. Well, way to folks. be a buzzkill. <laughs> I'm zooming in. Actually, on you can it make it. We, gotta, we can actually make it stand out a little. Because I could do this. And then this, and this, and this. Alright. There. Happy now? <laughs> I yep. think I actually. Uh, I think I uh, brought out a little bit more. Let's go to auto and see what it looks like in this. Well, there you go. Yeah. Now that cluster stands out. As it should. That's right. Okay. All right. Thank well, I am going, going to. No, it's fine. You're allowed. Your your indulgence is everyone else's benefit as well. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's put this puppy to bed now. Uh, how many do we got? 16 exposures. Okay. We'll pause it. Save it. Rename it. Um, uh, if you're saving it, you're rename right. it. Well, that's true. I didn't do that. So I'll rename it again. And will it give me the option of the renaming thing? Mm -hmm. Oops, no. We'll have to do it again. So there'll be there'll be one more of these here that uh, I'll have to fix. <coughs> there we go. And then save exactly as seen. I'll get in, I'll do editing, and I'll get rid of the directories that don't belong, don't worry. Fantasy, Fantasy. Uh, Go ahead. are you going to a club meeting or a club star party? If you're going to a meeting, just, you know, try to get to know the people, and maybe express your interests, and uh, find somebody of a like mind, uh, if you're going to a club star party, try to look through as many of their telescopes as you can. People are always happy to let people look through their scopes. And uh, you can... Oh, if you were looking at buying a telescope, that's a good way to go to uh, learn about the different types of scopes and uh, can help you make a, an informed decision. But the main thing, relax, have fun, just mix. And they learn things you didn't know you didn't know. Yeah, around here, uh, we don't have... Uh, we, we do have a, a, a astronomy clubs, but they actually have an observatory with a roll-off roof and a you know big scope that they use. Um, but, you know, not everybody gets a chance to look through the telescope. Um... But people tend to bring their own and set it up in the field where they're actually doing those kinds of star parties. That's kind of fun. Oh, yeah. Well, they do I've that I've talked here to that group. Uh, like every month, at least once a month, they yeah. have public star parties. And all the club yeah. members bring their telescopes and set them up and invite That's people cool. to come take a look. Yeah. You can look through refractors and reflectors and... Mm -hmm. Compound telescopes, you name it, little <clears throat> ones, big ones, and everybody's proud of yep. their stuff, and they're happy to show them off, and they'll answer all your questions for you. Yep. Very cool. All right, folks, well, um, we did a beautiful deep dive into uh, the, the Horsehead Nebula region tonight. And then we chose to do Measure 41, which is up on the server now, or on its way. So these will all be up there. I'll correct the directory structure where I messed it up. Uh, but that said, um, we are 
at a point where we are going to say goodnight. So I will I'll be closing down everything right now and making sure that we are done and buttoned up for the evening. So I want to thank you guys for coming out and enjoying Skyter livestream again. Enjoyed having you, Raymond. Thank you so much. You're the man. And uh, I want to share with everyone that the night sky is yours for the taking. Just make sure you look up. And look up with the telescope, look up with binoculars, or look up through Sky Tour and enjoy yourselves, all right? So, we'll see you the next time we stream, which could be pretty soon based on the way the moon is working. <laughs> so, we'll see you soon. All right, guys. Okay. You have a good night. We'll talk to you later. Night, everybody. Alrighty. See you guys.